Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Francis Di Tommaso, director of SVA Galleries, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone here to this evening's conversation between Michael Beirut and Stephen Heller. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our online audience who's watching this from the SVA website. This evening is also being tweeted live on the at SVA Twitter account, and you can ask a question by using the hashtag BeirutSVA. This dialogue is part of the master series Michael Beirut, now on view at the SVA Chelsea Gallery, 601 West 26th Street. The exhibition is the 27th in a series of career retrospectives originally conceived in 1988 to honor the great visual communicators of our time. The honorees have primarily been designers, but also illustrators, photographers, and art directors, who, held in high esteem by their peers, have remained virtually unknown in the public sphere, where their work is nonetheless widely recognized a consistent influence on the tenor and direction of contemporary visual culture. I invite you to visit the gallery and see for yourself the dazzling array of works that comprise this first Beirut retrospective. For those familiar with their careers, you know what a privilege it is to have these two giants of design speak with us this evening. For those of you not familiar, with the man who designed Manhattan, as the New York Times recently described him, you're about to learn why Michael Beirut generates so much buzz. For his interlocutor, here is a severely abbreviated biographical sketch addressed to the maybe two or three persons in this audience for whom the name Stephen Heller only rings a bell. In the late 60s, then an aspiring 17-year-old cartoonist, Steve landed a job doing mechanicals at the underground New York Free Press. A short seven years later, during which he started his own magazine, the New York Review of Sex and Politics, he was hired to art direct the op-ed page of the New York Times. He stayed there 33 years, most of them as art director of the book review. Over the last two decades, he has been a contributing editor to Print, I, Baseline, and ID, as well as the editor of the AIGA Journal of Graphic Design and the online AIGA Voice. All this while also co-founding the MFA Designer as Author Department at SVA and serving as its co-chair. The author, co-author and or editor of some 170 books on design and popular culture, and also the curator of numerous exhibitions and conferences, Steve received the AIGA Medal for Lifetime Achievement and the Smithsonian Institutional Institution National Design Award, among many other honorifics, including SVA's 2003 Master Series Award. On that nicely coincidental note, let us now listen to a discussion about the life and career of the 2015 master. At its conclusion, our speakers will take questions from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Beirut and Stephen Heller. Uh, but this is not about me, <laughs> is it, Michael? As much as you want it to be about you, Steve, okay. I'd support that. So. I've long admired Michael Beirut, going back to over 25 years ago when we were introduced at Massimo Vignelli's office, and I thought he was Lebanese. <laughs> and I keep spelling it that way. Years later, we worked together along with Paula Scher and Tibor Kalman on two different AIGA conferences, and then with Bill Drentel and Jessica Helfen on Looking Closer Design Criticism books. I admire his boundless energy, enviable elocution and erudition, incredible mastery of metaphor, which you'll doubtless hear tonight, 
his extraordinary logic, and not least, his piano virtuosity. From the moment I heard him play the 88s at an AIGA conference years ago, I knew this guy was cool. And you will agree that his suit is very nice. <laughs> Michael could have chosen a career in music, or science, or law, or government. Uh, and with that nasal twang of his, he might have been a progressive rock radio DJ. <laughs> But he loves graphic design and has devoted his past, present, and future to making it, discussing it, documenting it, and reveling in it. There are many smart design makers and thinkers, but after rereading Michael's earlier book of essays and his recent monograph, which is on sale here, I think Michael has earned his place on the main stage in the design pantheon, and not just about desi graphic design. Paul Rand used to tell me about the right way to design, which just happened to be his way. <laughs> when Michael speaks his design talk, he does not impose unalterable truths, but rather allows for the laws of nature to govern design. Nonetheless, he has coined some illuminating truisms. He recently told me that it's not his job to educate a client about design. That's not what he's hired for. And his reluctance to use his pulpit to preach is one part of what makes him such a seductive conversationalist. The other thing is Michael's keen ability to turn a phrase. I guarantee that throughout the course of this evening, you'll tweet many of Michael's pearls. But before he utters them, I prevailed upon a few of Michael's friends and colleagues to share some of the gems, and here are two that ring true to me. Hamish Smith told me that after a client had rejected a logo that everyone on your team loved, you said, we gave them a cure for Ebola, but they chose to remain sick. <laughs> <laughs> and Paula Cher recalled your warning that clients are not are normal people. Normal people don't know anything about stupid things like typefaces. <laughs> That's right. Well, this audience is full of abnormal designers and design students, so we can happily talk about typefaces, logos, design jargon, and all that other nerdy stuff. There'll also be time for questions uh, with this and our online audience. So I'd like to start our conversation with this. You seem to have avoided locking into a recognizable Beirut graphic style, but you have an aesthetic and conceptual attitude. Can you tell us how this has worked for you and whether or not you can define, through some of the examples we're about to show, what constitutes a Michael Beirut philosophy, method, attitude, or whatever you want to call it? Um, thanks, Steve. Um, it's, um, it's actually, you're right, it's hard for me to talk about my own kind of approach to design because I really look at every job as being different. I don't assume that anyone comes to me because, I don't like it when someone comes to me because they saw something I designed and they want another thing that looks like that thing. I'm not good at that and I'm not, I, I can't even reliably replicate the thing I did last time, the appearance of the thing last time with the next thing that comes along. Um, instead, a lot of times people will simply come to me and my team at Pentagram with a project like the one behind us, which was for the New York Department of Transportation, where really the brief was so dense, complicated, and intricate um, that it was just a matter of managing all the detail and weaving it all together into a coherent whole, figuring out what typeface was to go on those maps, what color the parks would be, how we'd render each of the landmarks, how, you know, how we would uh, um, uh, indicate where the entrances to subways were. That's what we would argue about. And it's very hard to impose style on things like that. You know, the, the problem is just so intricate. It's like trying to, it's like trying to impose style on like a... Uh, um, you know, a crossword puzzle. You mm -hmm. know, you can be good at doing them. You can do them fast or slow, but it, the thing is going to come out almost the same way no matter how you do it. Sometimes. I just want to mention that's one of his analogies that you should be tweeting. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's tweetable yet. I'll indicate the tweetable ones by warning in advance. I'll count. I'll say one, two, three, four, and count up to 140 characters, and you'll know you're you're good to go. Michael, I think actually we had made a deal that Michael wouldn't uh, click around because he's the star, and cl stars don't click. But uh, I think you may have to. I'll, I'll, okay, if you want. At least for this yeah. round. Um, it, it's very similar to do the um, uh, sign on the New York Times building where uh, Tracy Cameron is sitting right there. Uh, had the uh, task of um, figuring out with me how to get a big sign on a glass building 
that was required by zoning that every sign in Times Square has to have at least one and preferably more big signs on it so it looks like, you know, Times Square. Uh, Renzo Piano's building made of glass and steel, completely transparent. Your former place of employment, Ashley, Steve. But you were in the old place, right? No, I ended up in, in the new place. Yeah, so well. the, I couldn't look out the windows, yeah, this thanks be, to you. No, no. no. <laughs> so that sign is actually, it looks opaque from below, but when you look at it straight on, it's actually made out of uh, um, all these little uh, individual pieces that are attached to the Brisa Soleil that uh, uh, Renzo Piano and his team put on the building. So it sort of accomplishes both things. I maintain that... Uh, that it was very hard to work it out, but again, I think that it was sort of the uh, virtually the only solution that could have been done for that particular job. And, um, uh, you know, figuring out, sort of just working our way to it was a challenge in that regard. Now, this well, is before sorry, you talk ahead. about this, Should I go one thing I want to thank you yeah. for are the, the uh, signs on our office doors. Oh, so, uh, you know, and on the other hand, uh, the, um, there's, I don't have a picture of it, but um, if you, if you if you've already purchased or you purchased the book or you asked for for Christmas, you will see reproduced therein all these different signs we did for the New York Times interior rooms, which are all each one of them is different. Uh, every men's room sign has a different picture with guys on it. Every women's room sign has a different picture with women on it, and they will be from the entire history of the publication of the Times. Every mechanical room has something mechanical photographed on it, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the door to the balcony, which has a picture of the Pope on it. So you can. <laughs> sort of declaim as you want from that balcony. I assume Steve has fantasized about doing that or perhaps has actually done that. So. I think now I will do yeah, that. Yeah, I should. Um, so th sometimes there are projects that require a kind of anonymity. Um, and like I remember uh, this particular sign, while we were working on it, I was sure about everything except whether or not it would actually be legible, uh, particularly at the, like this time of night when it was sunset, the lights were coming on on the inside, and a full-size model of it was built out in New Jersey just with one letter, a letter E, as I recall, the E from Times. And, even, and so everyone looked at it and, was, and sort of became satisfied that, yeah, it would probably work. But I remember uh, being on a bus going up 8th Avenue um, the day that they started installing the sign. And I remember, wait a second, the, the today's the two, if it's Tuesday, this is the day the sign's supposed to go up. So I switched to the right-hand side of the bus, and I saw, actually, I looked out and I saw, oh, you could read it, you could read it. I almost like, was jumping up and down. And, uh, and actually, if you want, um, if you want to get extra elbow room on a New York City bus just overreact to a sign on a building. People really give you as much space as you need. It's quite, uh, quite luxurious, you know. Uh, so people backed away, but I sort of calmed down after that. So I think it's exciting, but I'm not sure. Most people walking by there just say, oh, that must be where the New York Times is, and they continue walking on, you know. I actually do think it's very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. When you have that capacity, so. Uh, this is actually kind of an interesting piece, because I would, there are, there are things that I th think, like uh, you did the street signs, the yeah, parking yeah. signs, the, the no pooping yeah, signs, yeah. Uh, and I would walk by these flush left, uh, beautifully typographically lined up signs and think, I wonder if Michael did that. <laughs> and I, of course, I never called you to ask, but I found them at the show quite nicely yeah. displayed. But that's something I would ask myself. Did Michael do this system? Yeah. This is something I wouldn't think Michael did. Yeah, Can well, you this speak for Michael. Well, it's um, yeah. Um, well, what Michael would say if he were here is, you know, um, the um, and this is, this is a case where it was really specific. Where this is a, a guy named Jeff Braverman was a third generation nut vendor from uh, uh, New Jersey, and uh, he had taken the company online, uh, purchased uh, a hard to get URL. Their their URL used to be nutsonline.com. And then nuts.com became available, so he got it. I, I can't tell you who he bought it from, but use your imagination. Um, and, um, uh, and so basically what he and the Braverman family have done for generations is uh, sell nuts, and now they do it online. So if you go to their great website, you can buy all these snacks and whatnot. And then it comes in packages that look like that, in boxes that look like that. And, and they do no advertising. Their only advertising is actually the packaging and you know, people leaving, you know, when people do leaving their research, shells. You know, leaving shells around, exactly. But so it was a, and it's a family owned business and they have a great sense of humor, really lively personalities. And so this wasn't about, it, this is a time where I'm kind of grateful that I don't, that I'm not a standard bearer for some particular ideology. Mm -hmm. Because I think my former boss, Massimo Vignelli, he would have said, well, 
I guess for this I'll use, you know, Futura, you know, because it's more fun. Uh, <laughs> type joke for Evan Hore, you know, some people don't know that. So, um, uh, so, um, um, so instead, you know, um, we tried a bunch of different things and I said, let me just go hand letter this myself. So that's a typeface done by Jeremy Meckel based on my lettering. And um, then we had Nicholas, um, uh, um, we had um, uh, Nick, uh, huh? Christoph Neiman, Christoph Neiman, sorry, do draw like these little characters. You see one poking up there. And uh, so it was like really just about expressing the personality of these nutty people. They didn't come, to, I don't think, that, you know, Jeff, Jeff called me up because his wife was in a spin class with a woman who was married to another client of mine. And they, I was just, you know, I need some packages. Who knows how to do that? So they came to me. So they weren't coming for my style. They were coming because they wanted, you know, to sell some peanuts. And by God, you know, they have, so. And you're a salty character. Yeah, I'm salty. I know less than you'd think, actually. So the next on. group, uh, one, is part of a, a series that you've done. Yeah, I, um, um, I've been working for the Yale School of Architecture for nearly 15 years now. And um, the, so this is one of probably 80 plus posters that's displayed in, in the exhibition. By the way, uh, Francis, who introduced us uh, and his team, did an amazing job installing this work. Um, the work is such as it is, but the installation is so gorgeous and perfectly done. If you um, go to it, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Um, if, if you're disappointed by the work in the vitrines and hanging, you will be delighted by the hardware that is actually hanging the work and the beautiful way the vitrines and tables and everything else has been made. So please go see it. But um, uh, there's a bunch of, there's about 80 plus of these posters hanging in one of the galleries there. And they represent um, work that I was asked to do by the Dean Robert A.M. Stern, who had arrived on the scene and was determined to prove to people that he was going to run a very diverse and eclectic uh, um, program there that would not be ideologically based, but instead would express all, would respect and express and, uh, you know, um, honor all sorts of different strands of architectural practice. So again, this is, in this case, his, Bob's, Bob Stern's previous place of employment was, um, uh, the Columbia School of Architecture. At Columbia, a fantastic designer named Willy Kuntz had been working for them for years and had developed this style of posters as remarkable. They used the same typeface over and over again. Same typeface, almost same colors. Same typeface, same, same format, same grid. Amazing. In fact, year after year, they were beautifully the same. Yeah, they're beautifully the same. They vary slightly and sort of, it was almost like watching you know, what slight change would he make to it from year to year? And by God, if you saw one of those posters, you didn't have to read a word. You knew that it was from the Columbia Architecture School. So that wouldn't have worked for what Bob Stern wanted to do at Yale. And I don't think designers who, again, were sort of uh, determined to work through a specific style would have had um, difficulty with that assignment. Instead, I came back and I said, my plan is to never use the same typeface twice. We happen to have one up here that... Uh, features Helvetica in it, but it's, I think, virtually the only time Helvetica made an appearance in all 80 of those posters. And, uh, you know, previous Helvetica would have been something like, uh, I'm not kidding, like Dom Casual, no joke, if you know typefaces. Hobo, I don't know. It looked like you that. used Hobo for something. You think so, maybe. Well, there was an Art nouveau -y poster. Yeah. Hobo was Art Nouveau, in your opinion? Yes. Hmm. You want to yeah. fight? <laughs> <laughs> no, carry on. Uh, moving along. Uh, so, um, um, so this the, the the we sort of try to pack some little things into this. So, if you have good eyesight, right back there, the rush, the um, the wine a circle changes every time. It's always done differently. That's the logo. It's a circle with a wine. It can be any wine. And in this case, because it's about architecture and psychoanalysis with the Mies van der Rohe couch with all the type like buildings on it, um, the, the, the Y is a Rorschach blot. But again, I made that myself. I had to research Rorschach blots to do it. Hard to do. You did, I mean, there are 80 posters and there are 80 different designs, all with lots and lots of type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you must have a great deal of patience. Um, I have a great deal of patience and really, really talented, eager people working for me who have tons and tons of energy and for whom that particular series has been a great way to, uh, um, to just try out new things, to, um, uh, you know, uh, I had a designer who used it sort of to audition interns for a while, you know, just to kind of like try designing one of these posters, see how that works out. So those 80 ones are, um, I had a hand in all of them. Sometimes I can point to a sketch in one of my notebooks that matches what occurred absolutely. Sometimes I would literally say, 
do something. The last one was like this. This one should be more like that. You know, I, I'm not kidding. This so, is your direction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're also a choreographer. Yeah, or a conductor. I conductor, prefer to conductor. Yes. Yeah. yeah I'll uh, keep moving on. So, uh, yeah. Are you a football player? No, I uh, I was very nerdy. I was not good at sports. I was really a uh, nerdy, bookish, uh, um, lonely um, kid who learned that drawing and lettering could get me uh, out of fights on the schoolyard. So you got out of fights by doing the Jets logo. This yeah, gives was, you a lot of equity for many yeah, yeah. years. I, I have an FVD Testaverde right here. Right now, I'm going to say no. It's um. Uh, it was, um, th this is an interesting case because we were hired to do a new, we were hired to do their brand identity, but the requirement was we weren't allowed to change the logo. And so that again became an exercise in how can you figure, you know, what are the ingredients of an identity? And then we decomposed the logo. We had Jonathan Heffler and Tobias Frere Jones extrapolate a whole typeface family. This might have caused their breakup. I, I'm, I think this kept, it was, it was like the baby that kept them together longer, perhaps. How about that? Uh, but, um, but so we just kind of like took this thing and treated it almost, uh, you know, tried to get as much, render as much value out of that little logo as it could possibly do. So, um, and then, um, you know, uh, sometimes when you work with a collaborator like Errol Morris, you really are just trying to express his particular vision and this is a 800 page examination of a well, well reported murder that happened back in the 70s. It's still really either solved or unsolved, but kind of uh, the guy who is- He came out on the side of the- uh, he, he doesn't think Jeff uh, right. McDonald did it actually. So he uh, came out on the side of not guilty. There's a guy who who's claims he's never actually, in, he's in jail, he's in prison for killing his family. He claims he never did it. And Errol reinvestigated the whole thing, asked us to do the book. And he's kind of crazy. He, at one point, you know, we did all these line drawings for the inside of every piece of evidence. And he said he wanted to, I think he sincerely wanted to release it as a children's coloring book, actually. <laughs> he, said, he said, oh, these make a great coloring book. Wouldn't they, can you imagine that? He was excited about that. Um, and I sort of, um, um, if you just want to keep rolling, is that yes, okay? Yes, keep okay. rolling. Um, I, 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 there's a kind of design that I like to do, which is just sort of like blunt and obvious. And I realize to some people that is, that may be another way of saying stupid and ugly. And for, the, for all of you, I apologize. So this is the, um, uh, this is the exterior of uh, uh, James Bieber's design for our the US Pavilion at Expo Milan, which is all dedicated to food. And um, it began as a, uh, uh, a cover for the proposal, the competitive proposal that he and his team submitted to get the, to get the award to actually do the pavilion. And um, I remember I sat with Britt Cobb, who's sitting over there, and we, I said, I walked over and I said, well, Jim wants us to do a cover for this proposal. We sat down, and this was sort of the simplest thing I could think of. I think Ivan Shermayev and Tom Geismar are here. And I literally said, I wanted to, you know, let's do something that kind of feels more, forgive me if you hate this, but I said, I want something that sort of feels the way those early 60s uh, World's Fairs felt that Shermayev and Geismar did those beautiful things and just sort of really simple and unashamedly American in a way. And uh, as we did it, we realized it's sort of, you know, there are all these like tasteful cities that have great, intricate, subtle food cultures. And what people want from America in that context really has to do as much as anything else with sort of the American road. There's a food truck court in the back of this, which is very popular. And this really just has the character of a billboard in a way. So, right. you know, so kind of bluntness carries the day again. So this next one, uh, the Mohawk uh, logo, is I'm actually using it in a book that I'm doing because I, I love the way it looks, I love the way it feels, but also you got rid of that uh, politically incorrect Native American. Yeah, so for years, Mohawk uh, Paper Company located upstate in Cohoes, New York, had a, a, a very nicely drawn, if you ask me, profile of a Mohawk tribesman, kind of in profile, like almost on a coin. Uh, and um, uh, it's sort of, you know, I guess, you know, I mean, they, they are, they actually have a good relationship with the Mohawk tribe up there, they're, uh, uh, who still kind of populate that area in New York State. But um, it was, you know, as much as anything else, as much as the political correctness was an issue, and it was, um, as we've redesigned their identity 
three times. And with this, the one before this also didn't have any uh, Native American imagery. But this one was really supposed to say this paper company is equipped to deal with the digital age. And so the way that, that's an M, and it sort of is simultaneously supposed to be invoking big rolls of paper, but also the connection between various points and uh, as one does electronically or digitally. I'm glad you said that because that's what I wrote without. Oh, did you really? Okay, yeah. good. Well, good. It worked. Now I, I feel guess, better. Yeah. Good. Uh, next one is environmental. Yeah, and uh, um, this is an example of a long running project that I worked on uh, that was sponsored by the Robin Hood Foundation, which some of you may know as a philanthropy here in New York City. Um, they started this very ambitious process of redesigning public school libraries in neighborhoods that were really underserved and under-resourced and disadvantaged. The theory being if you, if you couldn't uh, redesign the whole school from top to bottom, at least if you could fix the library, you could create kind of a, uh, an oasis within that school that would have real tender, loving care there. And uh, our real job, I thought, was to design a logo for the program, which we did. Then I thought, put some signs up, you know, exit, enter, and, you know, history, math, label the sections of books. And then one of the architects, uh, uh, Richard Lewis, uh, asked us uh, if we could do, if we could decorate the space above the shelf and the ceiling. And that, that, that wasn't in our scope, but we were doing it for free anyway. So it was a little bit of a moot point. It just was, what can we do to help? So uh, I said, you know, I'm not Diego Rivera. I'm not a muralist. But then we sat down and came up with this idea of installing this freeze of kids from the school, a little bit oversized, looking down at themselves in the library. And this proved so popular with the librarians who all visited each other's libraries that they started insisting that they have similar installations. So we ended up doing 30 of these, you know, and then enlisted a bunch of collaborators when we quickly ran out of ideas. My wife took those photographs, but then ultimately um, Stefan Sagmeister, Myra Coleman, um, you know, a bunch of different, uh, 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 Peter Arkel, all these different illustrators and artists contributed to that mural program. Uh, and so, and again, it's sort of fun. Another thing that I like to do because I'm lazy is do a Tom Sawyer type thing and uh, instigate the painting of a fence, make it look like fun, and then talk people into painting the fence because it's just such a riot while I... While chew you tobacco, chew tobacco or, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, smoke, uh, <laughs> smoke lemonade. <laughs> smoke, yeah, exactly. Um, and so uh, this was definitely a case of doing that. So. And the next one uh, speaks for itself somewhat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is a. Um, uh, I actually, I really like. I was going to say, I really enjoy writing. And you know, I when I was writing this, you know, what was I thinking? Um, you well, know, you wrote a whole series. Yeah, of these. yeah, there's a whole series of these. But basically, this is on the grounds of the Cathedral Church of Saint John the Divine. Uh, we had come up with a program for them that the premise of which was um, um, because if you've been up there, it's a beautiful and beautifully restored Gothic cathedral, right? People go in it and gawk at it because it's just awe-inspiring, but they m can miss the idea that what happens there are contemporary exhibitions, contemporary performances, contemporary concerts, as well as a really active community outreach program, mm. and it's also the seat of the Episcopal Church here in New York, right? So it, it has all these different functions, but it's so intimidating looking that what we thought we would do is combine, we took a, a Gaudi uh, black letter, kind of repointed it, and then made that at the official typeface for the church, which is called, uh, uh, divine, the typeface is called Divine, and then we write unlikely things with it. So they called up and said in their on their grounds people were uh, walking their dogs and failing to clean up after it, and could we come up, could we just put, put a sign up about that? And then uh, Jesse Reed and I uh, came up with a whole series of these, and uh, um, he had one that was he had one that was more dignified. I think it was collect what you receive, collect, <laughs> collect what you receive. And I said, well, that's that's nice, but let's just drive home the point. So, so this is the modern scripture. Yeah, exactly, the modern scripture for uh, your uh, um, uh, grace-seeking canine. Now we're in so. Uh, so we're in the political season now. So this was a uh, poster that I did in the wake of. Uh, what some of you may know from your history books, others of you may recollect uh, having lived through it, the, um, uh, re the recount in Florida that was provoked in, in, at least partially, not just by hanging chads, if you remember what those are, someone named Chad here, I think, um, but um, also the fact that this is not laid out really correct well. It's like if you look, you're supposed to punch the holes down the bottom, 
First name at the top, George W. Bush. First hole at the top corresponds to his name. That's easy. Second name down on the left is uh, maybe someone you would have wanted to vote for, Albert Gore, the Democrat. But if you punch the second hole down, you're actually surprised voting for Pat Buchanan, who's hiding over there on the right. What a surprise, by the way. Um, and uh, so about they estimate that maybe as many as 2,000 people inadvertently voted for Pat Buchanan in Palm Beach County, Florida. George Bush squeaked by, and that didn't really actually officially carry the state. The, the, the recount of the disputed ballots was shut down by the Supreme Court. Right. He lost the popular vote anyway. You know, so uh, because of typography and layout, perhaps uh, the course of the world was changed. So, and this was a competitor to Pentagram, right? Yeah, we bid on that job. Uh, you know, but um, I, I kept saying, does it have to be a ballot? You know, that was my, you know, so it's a, that's a designer <laughs> joke. I apologize. But it just goes to show there are no little jobs. It's a crummy little job. Government job, one color, boring, too much type, not enough space. But if you mess change up Change the world. Yeah, change the world, exactly. There'd be a country in the Middle East if... Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Right. So now it's uh, time to hear about the early Beirut. Yeah, well, I mean, I keep clicking this up. Excuse me? I just you, keep Yeah, in a moment. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite Kim Kardashian tell-all, but it is a reveal <laughs> that uh, I find gives a rounded picture of you. You are cute. Uh, so in the back, in now the back. you can guide us through these formative <laughs> years. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm from um, the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. I was born in a place called Garfield Heights. I then later moved to slightly classier. Can I say it? Yeah. Parma. Parma, Ohio. Um, if the you home of Bodoni. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't know from Bodoni in Parma, believe me, trust me. Um, uh, we, um, uh, it, was, it, was like, it was like regular suburban neighborhood, probably um, you know, middle class at best. And uh, uh, what, they didn't know nothing about graphic design there, I'll tell you that much, back in the 60s. As, 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 this is Easter Sunday, 1969. I'm the older kid in the back. In front of me is my mom, Anne Marie, my father, Lenny, and my two brothers who are fraternal twins named Ronald and Donald. <laughs> uh, and my now mom, we know where your wit comes from. Yeah, my dear departed mom gave me my wit and my propensity to rhyme. To, to, to rhyme, but I think uh, 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 when she would come, to, uh, she saw me speak a couple of times, and I often show this picture and say my brother. And then she would say to me afterwards, "Michael, why do people laugh when you say your brother's name? <laughs> They're twins. They're twins." So, what do you like? You name a Marvin and you know Jebediah. I mean, just you know. To rhyme, um, I forget the, if, there, if there were girls. I forget what that. Fernandale. <laughs> Fernandale. <laughs> yes, um, so um, um, I was uh, um, I, w I, w I was a lonely, nerdy little kid, and then I discovered I had miraculous God-given art talent. And my mom, God bless her, enrolled me in Saturday morning art classes at one of the greatest institutions in the world, the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, I, um, this is my drawing that I did at the age of seven. It's a copy of Turner's Burning of the Houses of Parliament. On the back it says, The Burning of the Houses of Parliament by Michael Barut. <laughs> so anyway, if, if anyone in this audience uh, uh, who worked for me thinks I ripped off your designs ever, or anyone else thinks so, believe me, I started at the very top with Turner. Uh, and you could have done the, the poster for V for Vendetta. <laughs> I could have, yeah, that's right. Um, but the, um, the um, uh, uh, what's uh, appealing about that, of course, to a seven-year-old boy is that it's all about explosions and fire, and it's sort of, it's sort of easier to draw than you know than a David would have been, I suppose. So mm. you know, picked up on. It. Um, and then um, this is another another work by me from I was in the sixth grade. This supplemented. It wasn't required, but it was an added kind of like extra point bonus at submission of my, the big uh, sixth grade social studies report that I did on a topic of my choice, in this case, the sinking of the Titanic, way ahead of uh, James Cameron on this one. And, uh, and the only thing here I'll point, I'll call your attention to is the loving attention that I paid to the iceberg, and then the casual dismissive way I, I drew the uh, drowning victims. Uh, I, they, they were really not of interest to me. I just loved that iceberg, though. I just loved it. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so I sort of, and, and I, got, I got an A plus on this paper, and I think that plus was because of this drawing, actually. I think I put it over the top. The rest of it was good, but this drawing was really great. Big pen, by the way. And you can sort of tell how lonely I was, right? You know, there's no one really coming around to disturb me. It's like, well, I crosshatch. Sounds the sky like you wanted to sea. drown the people. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
Yeah, sort of like die, die all of you, more drowning people, yeah. You wallowed in your loneliness. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, then I had a, an electrifying experience uh, uh, in the, three years later, um, having, having kind of uh, consolidated my reputation as a good artist, uh, um, I was asked to do the poster for the school play that we printed in the silk screen shop in the basement of the half vocational school that I went to. And, um, oh, sorry, this is the, I, just, uh, I forgot that I had this antidote come up. This is the logo that changed my life. My dad pointed at this while, we were, while I was getting my hair cut and said, look how, look how clever that is. And I said, uh, what? And he says, well, it's, it was on a forklift truck. And he said, you see how the L is lifting up the A just like the truck does? And I was like thunderstruck by that. I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Like, you know, is this happening everywhere? Where else is this happening? <laughs> you know, uh, these little surprises, these, these like delightful little visual surprises all over the place. If so, where can I find them? And further, how can I learn to do them? And I didn't know that there was some way you could learn to do it. I just knew from Turner and the other people in the art museum. And this increasingly lonely thing I came to associate with doing art you know, where you would just draw the Titanic and cross hash the iceberg, then die, and then someone would discover you and you'd be in a museum then, you know. And just you'd be copied by somebody copied, like Michael copied by some, copied some younger version of yourself, yeah. the, the, the final insult, right? And so, but I thought, that's cool. you know, this, this, this logo was on every piece of, every forklift truck in the neighborhood. It was fantastic. And I used to point it out with glee. I'd say, check it out. And some people would uh, be impressed. Other people would, like, try to punch me, you know, because I had a very punchable face, I think. Well, you did say you were a nerd. I still may now, actually. Uh, But then finally, I sort of hit the big time and designed this poster for the school play, Wait Until Dark, 1972. I didn't know where type came from. I didn't know, um, but they gave me the play. They read it. Some of you may know it's a thrilling story about a blind woman who's being tortured by three thugs, and she uses her, uh, her, uh, in a way, her sightlessness to kind of actually outsmart them. So you have those scary eyes and everything else and the kind of weird lettering at the bottom. But the key thing was I arrived in school having submitted this uh, piece of artwork on the back of a you know, piece of cardboard from, you know, uh, that came with a laundry or something that I'd done with a, a felt tip pen. And it was all over the school. It was like everywhere. Like they, there was like in every hallway, on lockers, everywhere. Like I, I thought, I'm fam- my name's not on this at all, but I was thinking, I'm famous, I'm famous. My art is like everywhere now. And I became like addicted. Like to me, even to this day, if I open a box of something and there's more than one of something that I designed in it, I get like really excited. I, I think, you know, I'm, I can I'm, I'm famous. I'm <laughs> I don't think the people in the audience can see the sweat dripping down your sideburn. <laughs> Try to calm down. <laughs> No, so I think so. I mean, I have to admit there was something, and and and, and there was more than that too. It was that um, I got to hang out with the drama kids. I was so nerdy that the drama kids represented a cool step up for me. Can you imagine? Um, you know, then from there to the band kids. You know, uh, and AV. Where did they? AV, AV was like so. They were in a booth somewhere. You know, as we are here. So I wasn't qualified to go there yet. But um, the um, it was just like so. It was like a social thing. I got to read the play, and then like the drama kids would say, the oh, poster was cool, baby. And they made a small version around the program. They gave the program to everyone who sat down to see it. And I, you know, I sort of felt like I was like, you know, in show business, sort of, you know? And, uh, and, and to this day, you know, part of the joy of putting the sign on the outside of the New York Times, fiddling with the Jets logo, even doing, um, you know, those school libraries is that part of the day where I can go visit libraries and talk to librarians or insinuate myself in the locker room of a professional football team, ostensibly because that will help me kind of understand the brand better, or go to the, you know, the, the, the meeting where they're deciding what's going to be on page A1 of the New York Times, ostensibly so I can do the bathroom signs better. But to sort of <laughs> insinuate yourself in all these different places is one of the joys of being a graphic designer. And I think anyone who does it, if, you're, if you work in publication design, if you work in any field at all involved with graphic design, you're able to sort of, it's a, it's a social activity. There's, you need other people to do it. You need, you need collaborators, you need people helping you generate what the content is, and then ultimately you need an audience who can see and appreciate it or not, you know? So that's what makes it fun. You'd be a great recruiter for some design school like we're in. Yeah, exactly. So it's every, SVA worth every penny, you students. Uh, you have a wonderful, wonderful career ahead of you as long as you don't focus too much on the typefaces and the PMS colors, because that's sort of the least important part, if you ask me. So let's continue. You, uh... 
learned your your craft somehow. Yeah, and it didn't I, just fall in. Yes, I um I had my my turning point was discovering a book that you know as well. This amazing book called uh, "Aim for a Job in Graphic Design Slash Art." by S. Neil Fujita, a fantastic underappreciated designer who designed, as I found out later, the cover of the, the, the book of The Godfather, which, in, which originated that logo, which you know from the movie, if nowhere else, and the Columbia Records logo. What a guy. Um, and a lot of Columbia Records. And a lot of Columbia Records covers, too. And book jackets. Yeah, and book jackets as well. So um, I found this book in our high school library back in Parma, Ohio. And, in, and sort of, it was, it was like, it gave a name to that thing I wanted to do. I picked it up because it had art on it, but next to it had graphic design, which I would have guessed had something to do with printing. My dad was a printing salesman, and anyone he knew that did, anytime he'd see anyone doing commercial art, they were in the back of a print shop pasting up a church bulletin or a bowling score sheet. <laughs> and so he, he, it never occurred to him to steer me into that uh, uh, field. He had higher hopes for me, actually. But then I had this book, and it was called Graphic Design. And inside were all these profiles of like real graphic designers, the young Lou Dorsman, the young Ruth Ansel. You know, I think Archie Boston was in there. It was really an amazing book. It was an amazing book. It was an amazing book. And I, I remember just being, it was, like, it was like going to the doctor with some ailment. And you know that sense when they say, oh, I know what's wrong with you. It's, it has a name and it has a cure. And what I and the fever I had was graphic design, and the cure was like doing graphic design somehow. But it's just such a relief to know that what I wanted to do actually was a real thing. And so I've always called myself since then a graphic designer. I sort of I'm not one of these people who sort of seeks to kind of like wriggle out of whatever uh, straitjacket that's supposed to. Uh, 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 supposed to create by limiting you just to graphic design. I think you can navigate so much and in so many areas by doing that that it's really fun. So I got my training at the University of Cincinnati. Oh, these were some of the other options. Had I picked up the wrong book, <laughs> you guys would all be, I'd be talking to an auditorium full of bakers or barbers or civil servants or something else, but I lucked out and... But whatever you picked, you would have been on stage somewhere. <laughs> somewhere, actually, yeah, being recruiting for it, as you say, so... Um, I went to the um, University of Cincinnati, uh, where I had all of this stuff kicked out of me by very rigorous professors who... They were uh, very modernist school. Modernist school, Swiss trained, many of them, Yale trained, uh, uh, many of them. Very, very serious about graphic design. Um, I, I actually have a bachelor of, si bachelor of Science in Design. So I'm like a design scientist, actually, as opposed to a... ABS. Yeah, ABS. Yeah. Oh, but maybe, oh, I never... I always assumed the S stood for science. Maybe it all stands for something else altogether, now that you mention it, Steve. Um, and, um, but, and so I studied there, but it was, at, it was in the heyday of this period where uh, this was a party invitation I did in 1980 that we just like that we xerox and put on and you know hung up in the hallway of the school i did it myself this time but it shows sort of all the bad habits that people doing this sort of work could uh, indulge in at that time before we go to the next i just like to mention if we read the uh, explanatory panel in your show correctly you were born went to school and then worked for massimo and leila uh, so what did they give you and what did you bring to them? Uh, you obviously didn't f fall totally in line with Helvetica and Bodoni. Um, I, I, no, I didn't. I didn't, but when I, from 9 to 5 I did. I was a true, you know, um, I, I, you know, I was a really enthusiastic mimic. I would like, you know, after I got um, this, the, that Neo Fujita book in graphic design and studied that, I looked up graphic design in the card catalog of the regional library, and they had, bizarrely enough, graphic design manual by Armin Hoffman. This mm. is in suburban Cleveland, the one copy that perhaps existed in the state of Ohio. I was the one person who took it out uh, for months on end, and I was doing, like, you know, recapitulating the course of study at the Kunstgewerbeschule in Basel, Switzerland, for a while there in high school, to the chagrin of, like, the football coach who just wanted me to do a ball sports program with a football player on it. Instead, I was saying, no, it should be a abstract leaf with, like, you know, so he was unimpressed <laughs> by that. Uh, and, then, and then I said, Mom, I want this book for Christmas, and she called up and found out, yes, indeed, there was a book called Graphic Design, newly on sale, and it turned out to be Graphic Design by Milton Glaser. And then I just started copy Milton Glaser. So I had like really become almost, you know, like a ventriloquist or a uh, chameleon or whatever you want to say uh, in the hands of uh, these better, you know, inspirational designers. So when I started working... Sounds from, like Zelig. It was, it was very Zelig-like actually. So I had some things in my portfolio that were Vignelli-esque. Massimo saw them and instead of thinking, oh, this guy copies me, 
he thought, oh, this guy has a lot of potential. He could be a great designer. <laughs> uh, which for Massimo is sort of one and the same thing, actually. Because um, Massimo actually, I mean, he, his ideology, and he's very ideological, one part of it was the role of designers to create you know, work that actually was rec rec um, repeatable, uh, that could be repeated by, copied by many people, and in so doing, you could improve the way the world looks the more people you get to copy your style, sort of. That's putting it really bluntly and meanly. A former uh, SVA Master Series honoree as well, Massimo Vignelli, he's a brilliant designer. But, and I came there, I think, thrilled to work there. It was like a good job in New York in the middle of a horrible recession in 1980. When I met you there, you were the only one that wasn't wearing a collarless jacket. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I never sort of thought I could pull it off. Massimo and Leila Vignelli, his wife, were both uh, the consummate image of glamorous northern Italians, great taste, great accents, great personalities, warm, talented, everyone that came through that office, all the clients, all the visitors, most of the other employees, all were just elegant. And I think, I remember I was, uh, you know, that, that was me on a really good day with a, I cropped it so you can't see the tie dangling almost down to my knees, you know, <laughs> uh, or what kind of shoes I was wearing, which may have been like hiking boots or sneakers or something. Um, but I just was so happy to be working there. I really was. And I just loved them. They were like uh, the mom and dad that I needed at that moment of my life in New York City. And, um, and I sort of, um, uh, f famously now, I've given this advice to many students, I had a period of my life when, we first, when I first moved to New York with my new bride, Dorothy, my uh, girlfriend from high school, um, we had an apartment that was three blocks away. on East. We lived on East 65th. East 65th. The office was on East 62nd. I had a 45 second commute if I really hustled. I could go in really fast. I could wake up, you know, it was Italian. You could wander into work between 9.30 and 10. I would wake up at 9.15, 9.20, do what guys do in the morning, which is next to nothing, um, and go get a donut and walk into work. My wife worked, on, worked in the World Trade Center, actually, on the sixth floor of Tower One uh, for um, what was then called New York Telephone, I believe. And um, she, um, uh, she would, she, that was like in that working girl era where she had to like wear a big bow tie and have a padded jacket and like a pleated skirt and she would wear sneakers to work then have her heels there. And so she had to be at work by um, 8.30. So she would get up like at 15 to 6 every morning or 5.30 to start getting ready and putting on all her armor. Then would take this long commute to, uh, uh, to the tip of Manhattan, right? And so she got up for like three and a half hours earlier than I did every night. So I would come home from work, she'd come home from work, we'd have dinner together, um, I would kiss her goodnight, I'd wash the dishes, and then after a while I just, our, our apartment was so cockroach infested and claustrophobic that it was actually an unpleasant place to be up alone at night in. Because uh, I, you know, I don't want to get into the details about the cockroaches, there were a lot of cockroaches. Uh, but so I sort of thought, you know, Dorothy, Dorothy would be snoring by then. Uh, and so I just would quietly lock the door and walk three blocks south, and I had a key to the office. I just would turn on the lights and work for three more hours. You know, so I had the second shift I was doing there, and I became enormously productive just because I didn't want to be hanging around, you know, my own, like, because I like being in the office more than... Uh, you didn't mind that she would be eaten. By the, the cockroaches never actually... They stayed in the kitchen, as far as I could tell. So <laughs> what was the one thing, and I'm sure there were more than one, yeah. but what was the one thing that you remember Massimo telling you that has stuck? Well, I'll give you a quote from Massimo. I'll give you a quote from Layla. And um, do it in accent. I will if you want, yeah. Um, um, Ma well, Massimo said, um, I remember, so first, I, I started there and I was like, nobody. I like, did things that, pe that students in this audience wouldn't even, wouldn't even recognize as like a, a design-based, graphic design-based activity. My job was like mixing rubber cement, putting thinner and rubber cement, and then, you know, it was more like, like working in a kitchen or something. It involved like liquids and stirring, you know? Uh, you know, and, and then like mess, it would fall over and we'd go everywhere. Then you'd cut yourself with a knife and you'd start bleeding. The whole thing was really very physical. And, um, and I remember, uh, um, you know, I sort of started at the bottom, like just in service to all the real designers that were there. And finally, I sort of like worked my way up. And a few years on, I started getting little projects. And finally, I was like allowed to talk, to, allowed to be seen by, maybe not be seen by, by talking on the telephone to clients. And so I was like, hey, I'd have conversations with clients. And then, you know, some underling at Massimo would have a client, and then his underling would work with me. 
And sometimes the underlings would get demanding and they'd say, move this here, move this there. And I, w I started getting really excited about the fact that I could like sort of, you know, be right on that chief and I would do it. Then I'd he'd say, make it bigger and I'd make it bigger. Then he'd say, make it bigger and make it even more red. And I would, no, he would never say, Massimo would approve of all those things, by the way, make it bigger, make it red. So I'm trying to think. So the, I was taking a lot of client direction. The deadline was the next day. Massimo came by my desk and he said, what is this? It's in a cheerful, pleasant way. He was always like really nice to designers, no matter how badly they were behaving or how badly they were messing up. He's like, well, he said, well, what's this? And I said, uh, you know, this is that thing that's due tomorrow for so and so client. And he says, well, why is that? why? He said, why I like this? It's sort of, you know, this is not right. He's, and I'd say, no, no, it's a. Uh, but they said they needed this phone number to be bigger so people would call. Them. And he said, no, he says this is horrible. He does his favorite thing. This is horrible. I'm like, he said, and he said, he said, no, this can't. This no, we can't do this. This is bad. And I said, but you know, it's due tomorrow. If it doesn't go out tomorrow, it's gonna to be late. And he said, and he said, no, I make a phone call. And then he, at my desk, he called up my, my client's boss and said, you know, listen, this thing, we just need more time. It's not good. We won't like it the way it is. And, uh, and, uh, and, he, and he said, um, and then, he, then he said, okay, great, and terrific, okay, bye. And he hung up, he said, now we have another week. We need to fix this thing. And I was kind of like, oh. oh which I was like, I really was literally, what just happened? And then he said, um, look, kid, he never called me kid, Layla called me. He said, look, Mike. Um, um, if, it's, if it's on time, if it's on budget, no one will care if it stinks. You know, if it stinks, no one will care if it was on time and budget. You know, it doesn't make any difference. And so it's only the work in the end that matters. No one will say, you know that thing, it's, it's not, it didn't look very good, but you know, it was really on time. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, so, um, and so I remember I sort of thought, and, and, and you can always make, and people actually respect you if you make that call. We can make it better for you, we just need more time. It doesn't work every time, but it would work for him. So the, my quote from Layla is, Layla, as you know, um, as you may know, was Massimo's partner at Vignelli Associates. And Massimo kind of portrayed himself as a creative fountainhead. And Layla like, tended to the more practical aspects of things. Although I think that, was, that whole dichotomy was over exaggerated and overrated by people who described that way, including me. They actually, I don't, think, I don't think Massimo was any more practical, but Layla was much more creative than, he gets, uh, than she gets credit for. And um, um, she, uh, I think Layla, after I'd really been working there for a while and was going to meetings regularly and was running the graphic design department, um, Layla actually was really nervous about the combination of me and Massimo going into meetings together. And I remember one time, the three of us, me, Layla, and Massimo were going to a meeting, and Layla said, not, said right outside the door, I remember her saying this, she stopped and said to Massimo, said to me, uh, she, went, she said, listen, if they bring up money, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and, and, you keep, and you make sure Massimo says nothing either, okay? Just don't say nothing, okay? And I said, right, right, right. And so the job was designing a shoebox for, uh, I, 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 for Ann Klein shoes. I remember that. And uh, um, so we, it was the initial interview, but we had the job somehow. So we were sitting down, the famous Vignelli's, me, uh, uh, Mike from Ohio, and the assignment was designing this shoebox. And then finally the client says, um, you have any idea what this sort of thing is going to cost? And I went, and in my head, I was thinking, okay, shoebox. It's got six sides. There's nothing on the bottom, so there's only five sides. There's the top, big moment, miniature poster. There's that end that has just the stuff like what size the shoe is. There's the two long ends, they're both the same. Then the back, you never look at. So, I thought, $4,500. So I thought, and, Mas, and Layla says, probably something like uh, $36,000. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, uh, and the client said, well, it's, I'll check our budget, but uh, it sounds like that'll work, and when it'll be ready. And, like, you know, and I was like, <laughs> okay. So we, we went out, and the first thing Layla said to me as the door closed was, how much, you, how much would you have said? <laughs> and I said, $4,500. She said, you see? You just made $30,000 by keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> Isn't that great? So, uh, 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 um, you know, Massimo used to give speech. I, I, I use this quote a lot. Massimo used to give speeches, and he would say, I'm the engine and Layla's the brakes. 
right? And, and I always thought, well, you know who you want to be, the engine, right? I mean, that sounds like the fun job. But then I remember, what do they teach you in driver's ed, right? You don't die because the car won't start. You die because the brakes fail, right? So it was really Massimo. It was, Layla kept that office alive all those years, and you know who Massimo Vignelli is because of Layla Vignelli. That's my I theory. think we should give people a chance to tweet that one. You know, so. Uh, tweet, tweet it at your own risk. Okay. So this, this is what I used to do with Vignelli. Um, this is a, something that Massimo did. Um, this is something that I did. Okay. So Massimo would say it's this client. There's horizontal stripes. There's black and red. And I sort of got it. And I sort of didn't think this was an opportunity for self-expression on my part. I assumed it was, you know, just carrying on a program. We had one assignment, a client that we did everything in black and red and Bedonian. And we had two, uh, the client had asked us to uh, design two, an, an, an invitation to an exhibition of avant-garde furniture. Then they called and said, we need another invitation. It's for a lecture by scientists from NASA about how they design things like the Space Shuttle and Skylab. And so I designed a single, I, I was really frustrated. Then they said the two things had to be combined. So I designed something that had this piece of uh, furniture on it with a pot of flowers on the top. And if you turn it upside down, it's a rocket ship. And I remember thinking, this is, Massimo would never do something like this because it was like, he would say it was corny and too cute or just silly. I took it on my shoulder to my wife and I said, I've made a breakthrough, this is the best thing I've ever designed. And then she said, who did this drawing? And I said, me. She said, who are you gonna get to do the drawing? And I said, I think I'm just gonna go with this sketch because it has a kind of naive vitality to it. And she's like, oh, whatever you say, <laughs> dear. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and so, um, but still there was something, you know, what was funny was the Vignellis were consummate modernists and consummate formalists. And uh, in fact, um, you know, when I came to New York, I admired that very much, but I also admired the tradition I came to associate with Fletcher Forbes and Gill, with uh, Brown, John Shemayev right. and Geismar, with people that actually brought ideas into the work. I can't say this is a brilliant idea, but it, what was interesting was it was red, that typeface is Bedoni, but what, what people who saw it remembered about it, if they remembered anything, was just the, the ingenuity of that drawing, such as it was. They right? thought Massimo must have been stoned. They, they thought he must have lost his mind or something. But he, you know, he's so patient, he let me get away with it, so God bless him. Well, now we've come to a point where we're going to look at uh, your process, so to speak. Yeah. You have lots of books like this. I went to the Michael Beirut section of the Duane Reed <laughs> to uh, buy my own. And they're not exactly the same. And I have a handkerchief that matches that. It was made specially for me by the guys. And, and if you get team, the poster you. that's outside, you, you can wrap your Christmas presents. <laughs> exactly. As much as you need of that so pattern. Beirut so Beirut can follow you into the spiritual yeah. world. Uh, why don't you talk briefly about the, the use of your books and how you started in, with them? In, I have them going back all the way to number one, which is dated 1982. So I started a couple years into my employment at Vignelli. I realized that I remembered things better if I wrote them down. So I started carrying one of these notebooks with me everywhere, at least everywhere um, in my business life. And when I use them, I don't, a lot of times they're just filled with phone numbers and you know, I'm writing down notes of what people are saying so I remember them later. I really, and I do that, like, it's really important to me. These aren't, I've seen art, I've seen designers' sketchbooks who are just filled with, like, creativity and drawings and things. And people who see these are always a little bit kind of surprised and disappointed that there's so many pages of, uh, of just phone numbers and columns of figures and... And post-it notes. And po some, the occasional post-it note, yeah, it was in there. Um, uh, and I think the... Um, you know, everyone, so, but some, like, I remember very distinctly, this is a boring meeting I was in, and I had gotten an assignment from the New York Times to do one of their op-ed illustrations from Nicholas Blackman when he was there, and the essay was by George Kennan from um, the Princeton Educated, uh, um, economist. Uh, no, not, econ not economist. He was a um, uh, public. Uh, he, he did. He was a foreign service guy. Foreign service. And, and he w wrote this editorial s s opposing the expansion of NATO. Uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and uh, and so and I was asked to do this black and white drawing that would accompany that editorial. I was in a meeting with some famous architects whose names you'd recognize in a second who weren't paying any attention to me at all. So I just thought I'm going to work on the New York Times thing, and they'll think I'm being dil diligent taking notes. So I worked out all those versions of that, and the one on the bottom one, and there it is in the New York Times. So you know, and I got $125 for that, I believe. So yay for me, and I defrayed some of the cost of being in that meeting with those architects. So. Um, and so a lot of times there's something um, in the book that's a drawing on the left, and you'll see it finished here in this poster I did for Yale. 
Uh, the one on the right, which is kind of cooler in a way, just didn't really seem to be as apropos. It was more fun to sketch, though, somehow. Um, these were the drawings we did for the Brooklyn Academy of Music back in 1995 that eventually turned into the program that they still use today. Um, so I, I cherry-picked the ones that really make it look like I do drawings in these books, then they turn into things later. It ain't necessarily so, though, you know. Um, this is the library project. That's the logo. The logo simply has a, um, an exclamation mark where the I in library is supposed to go. Um, and there it is in real life. Um, this is uh, an early drawing for the bags for Saks Fifth Avenue. You did those? That's, 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 what, that's, what you're, that's exactly what, um, when my mother-in-law used to have a Saks bag in the house, and my wife would say, you know, Mike designed those. And my mother-in-law would, would, she just was like, couldn't understand what that sentence meant in relationship to that <laughs> shopping bag. She like, first she'd think there's things in the shopping bag that I had something to do with. No, it's the actual bag itself. It has a handle on it, has, has indeed five sides, no top. So, and how much did we charge, you think? You know, I'm just gonna, let's not go there. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, those turned into this. So she, you know, I think it's, you know, and I think partly, you know, I actually, that reaction, is one of the things that was really satisfying. I can, t you know, I remember two things, I remember several things about this project. Um, one was that it took us a really long time to figure out that it would be okay to take their old logo, a logo that Massimo had used uh, indeed in the uh, late 70s to design a packaging program for sex, designed by Tom Carnese, if you're keeping score at home. Um, and uh, um, we took the, that logo, cleaned it up, and then did this fragmentation of it, which was, uh, stolen almost directly from um, Norman Ives, who some people in this audience will know he did this all the time, uh, but not on a shopping bag and not for sacks. So. Uh, uh, and, um, and what they wanted was something like the Burberry pattern be able to identify right away as theirs. And I said, you need to do a lot of stuff for that. Then finally we realized this would be OK. And it was so exciting to realize that this would work. And I remember thinking, this works no matter how you arrange the squares. It still looks like Saks. Were you playing with Rubrics Cube at the time? Oh, we, no, we, we didn't, no, but we made one of those little things that actually, that's in the, that's oh, in the exhibit, things, exactly. Yeah, one of those yeah, things yeah. where it's one square is empty. You move them around until you form the whole thing. But I remember the other exciting thing was um, I was in a restaurant with Dorothy. And someone walked in carrying one of these bags. It was the first time I'd seen like a stranger holding like the bag, and I, you know, it's just, I can't tell you how exciting that is. And like, and like, I, you know, did I say anything to this poor lady, you know? Um, hey, you know, I didn't say a word to you him, although. You didn't jump up and down and I jumped up and I knocked over the table and got stuff all over Dorothy and vaulted over her unconscious form. I love your no, enthusiasm. I you know, I didn't do any of those. No, I just kind of, like, mm, no, I sort of, mm, mm, mm. Dorothy's like, what? Sex bag, sex bag, it's what? Somebody, how am I maneuver? No, I said, no, no, it's like the, the lady's got that bag idea for sex. And she's like, oh, that's nice, nice. You know, so. <laughs> My wife is not a designer. She uh, started out working for New York Telephone, and then she um, uh, raised um, our three wonderful kids, then went back to school, got an MS, had an MBA, and then she uh, got an MSW. Now she's a psychotherapist. So yeah, she, she said she had practice at the amateur level on me for years, and she started to go pro, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I say that. It sounds right to me. Uh, so this is, um, uh, we just, uh, struggled for years, to, or for months, to do a, a, a logo for the Museum of Arts and Design on a Columbus Circle. And then finally, when we realized the direction we had been pursuing wasn't working, came up with one that did work, and it turned basically into that, which is the logo they still have today. Um, that we did this uh, logo system for MIT Media Lab, and this is a drawing that I worked out with uh, Aaron Fay, who was actually the mastermind of this, and kind of figuring out how the levels of connections would work between the various entities there, and it ended up looking more and like that. And before you turn this slide, we're going to come to something else, yeah. something that has garnered considerable criticism. Yeah. Perhaps you'd like to talk about it and well, maybe show it. Well, I, well, well, um, uh, there's a bunch of notes here. Another client on the right. In the bottom, you sort of see some drawings that represent the logo we did for Verizon. Or maybe I'm blocking it with my body. Maybe you consider yourself lucky for that. So, um, you know, my wife worked for New York Telephone. Uh, she actually worked for Bell Telephone. Um, but then New York Telephone was a baby Bell they had to get rid of. That t they turned into 9X. 9X oh, merged nice. with Atlantic Bell, I think. Or Bell Atlantic. Then Bell Atlantic merged with GTE. 
And when they merged with GTA, they formed Verizon. And then uh, Verizon at that point had a logo that had uh, Helvetica, bold italic, had a, um, uh, a Z uh, that had, was big and the tail of the Z went under the thing and faded out at the end. Then above it, it was, was a Zorro. It was a, yeah, like Zorro. Then above it was a V-shaped thing that again faded out. Um, and um, it wasn't one of my favorite logos in the world. And then we uh, got a call, would we like to get involved with perhaps changing it? And their brand pillars uh, were and are simplicity, accessibility, something like simplicity, accessibility, and, uh, um, and uh, reliability. And the problem with that logo was it was complicated, inconsistently used, and no one quite understood what all those things meant. Just like their service. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm going to say something really honest. I am a Verizon customer, and I have no complaints. And I have a, Fi I have FiOS connection at home. I call. I need a lot of customer assistance on the phone, uh, and I, I'm well, well satisfied with the level of customer assistance I got. I, and that was even before I had any relation with them forever. So, I vouch for them as a uh, as a uh, service provider. But I would say overall, telecom companies are not among the most beloved. Uh, capitalist enterprises in our country. No, those yeah. are oil companies. Yeah, people, you know, everyone says, I want to be loved like Harley Davidson or uh, Apple Computer. And you know, like no one, you know, no one gets tattoos with um, Sprint, <laughs> you know. At any rate, um, uh, that, um, so I mean, we actually went through this process of, uh, of reducing things to get more, as simple as possible, as clear as possible, and basically just kind of ended up boiling it down to the word Verizon with a check mark after it. The idea being that, you know, you check something off, it means that it's handled, I got that, everyone sort of understands it, so. New logo, check. Yeah, yeah, new logo, check. So there it is, that's what, if you wait long enough, you'll eventually get an iPhone that has that on it instead of the uh, existing logo on it, so. Do you get the same chills when you see it? Oh, you know, I, in Grand Central, they got a massive brand takeover for Fios, and, uh, um, you know, it sort of is like, um, I think to myself, I, I never yell out I did that, and people might say, you did that, what does that mean? You know, it's just a, you know, how much do they pay you to do that? Just some lettering with a check after it. But um, all I can say is like, you know, $4,500 doesn't sound like a lot of money, but you know, <laughs> Layla Vignelli wasn't there enough. So uh, um, the, um, um, you know, it's, this was a case where I actually felt really strongly, unlike say MIT Media Lab, which is really narrow casting to a audience that's operating at a certain level. This is a really ubiquitous brand, and it's, if, with any luck, this logo will be around for a long time, and it'll be manipulated by different people other than me for many years to come. Ad agencies, different designers will do things with it. And I, I, I'd spend a lot of time thinking about how the Target Target works. You know, that was designed, in fact, by Unimark, Marcel Vanilli's mm -hmm. company in the late 60s. And if it was launched today, can you imagine the, twi the Twitter storm that would ensue? You know, this is all they could come up with. Its name is Target, and the logo is just a Target. What do you think accounts for this constant Twitter storm of I, you know, logo I, bashing? I really don't quite. I mean, I, well, I, I mean, I actually, I, I think it's a little bit baffling. I think it's something about having funny negative opinions about things is sort of what the internet is made for. Um, you know, again, as just as people don't get tattoos with the names of telecom companies, no one ever says loving the new you know, Verizon logo, you know, lo the, that new Google logo, logo, so cool, love it, you know. Like people just sort of say, you know, who, did, like, they, they come up with things they think are clever, but they're just sort of like, uh, um, my four-year-old could have designed that. Oddly, it looks like it was designed in PowerPoint. That's like a big thing. Right. And it's like, no, I used the Hadron Collider to design it. Are you <laughs> impressed? You know, what the, who cares? I did this thing with a pencil. I had a pencil that anyone could own, you know, but then maybe I'll use like a, you know, a ruling pen. Well, have logos you, become you know, a substitute <laughs> for something else? Well, I think in some cases, people have these feelings about the things the logos stand for, and, they, um, and then they'll kind of, uh, well, they're, they're, they're behaving as they should. That's what symbols do, right? Symbols represent things, and they become the placeholders for our feelings about them. So I don't feel like it's a bad thing that people have these feelings. So, Well, there's no logo there, but here's the one. Yeah, so I worked on this one, and I remember I had the same feeling. I was... Uh, this one is what again? This is for uh, um, the next president of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Okay, we're not politicizing. Yeah, we're not politicizing this evening. Um, uh, I got we are I got called by. But them. I, was, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of applause. <laughs> no, but, but it's nice almost like saying Ted Cruz. Oh, come on, Ted Cruz, please, or 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 Lincoln Chafee. 
Give it up. No one. Yeah, so here we are. Um, Bernie Sanders. You know, say, uh, they don't care. They don't care. They're apolitical. They're here for the design, it's, here for the shapes and colors, exactly. not here for the it's, politics. It's only America. Um, so the, um, um, I got called by um, some people with the campaign asking me whether I would do this. And I, I said yes immediately. It's pure volunteer work. I put together a uh, small cadre of, uh, of people in the office, uh, Jesse Reed, Julia Lemley, who's right there. We all worked on it together uh, under the cloak of secrecy. No one else knew we were working on it. And um, this is exactly the logo we wanted them to do. Uh, we weren't forced to do this. This is what we wanted to do because we had this big idea. And the big idea was the logo would change all the time. And, and it would be a really simple form that would change all the time, a simple form that indeed four-year-olds could draw. And I remember seeing when, uh, it, when she put out her launch video, at the very end, this animated thing came on. And it was my logo. And I did jump up and down. I was like, I can't believe it. That's really the logo. They really did it. I can't believe it. And I was so excited about it. And then, like I swear to God, I went online and... You know, it was like this, lucky third grader, um, designed by, this is Ben Schott, who I think is a smart guy, designed in PowerPoint, okay? So we used Creative Suite 5, or I don't know what, I don't know what we used, but at any rate, um, no, we used fancy things, not PowerPoint. The, the, the wave yeah. of interest yeah. amongst the journalists was this one high, was. Yeah. Yeah. and the depth of criticism was deep. Yeah. So were you prepared for it? No, I wasn't actually. And in fact, I wasn't prepared and I had a philosophy that says at the bottom, uh, uh, it shows um, um, our vice president saying, I worked for months developing the Hillary logo and this is the thanks I get. He's so sad, right? <laughs> um, uh, the, um, um, no, I, what, what I, but I, I actually, it, it was, it, it was kind of painful. The, the worst thing about it was I sort of had bowed to myself and I had a tacit agreement with the campaign that, 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 that sort of like kind of getting into some sort of argument about the logo was really unhelpful. And the only thing you could do is just lay low and think this too shall pass, right? And um, I have to admit, because they launched with the red and blue logo, and I kept thinking, no, it's going to do all these cool things. Why can't it do the cool things? And I remember like um, saying to someone at the campaign, why don't we kind of show those very, and they said, just chill, chill out. It's going to be okay. And so, um, but yet, you know, <laughs> Do you have a favorite takeoff on it? Was oh, yeah, no, it? I, I have several. So that's not my favorite. That's terrible. This is definitely not my favorite. That's terrible. Um, Hillary's logo is awful. Looks like a sign for an ER department at a hospital. But the bottom, Internet Musing says, when I see this, I wonder what Paula Scher of Pentagram would have done and said. I ask myself that question every day about every single project I work on. Um, this is my, th I laughed out loud when I saw this. You, this may not mean anything to you. You get it? <laughs> Thank you, Charts and Maps, and Laura Coogan. Um, and um, the thing that happened, oh, so design experts trash Hillary Clinton's new logo. Uh, that's for the record there. So this came out, and I have to admit, this was cool. Some guy actually took it and made a whole alphabet with it and called it, he, he called it Hillvetica. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember thinking that was cool, and then someone else actually put it in Fontographer and or whatever you do nowadays and turned it into a real logo, or turned it into a real typeface. And then the Hillary campaign did this. And I remember, and I sent them a note and said, that is so cool, thank you. And they said, oh, we were afraid you wouldn't like it. I said, no, I think it's fantastic. It's exactly what should be happening. And then we started getting like, you know, uh, Felix Sockwell, who's a friend of mine, said his kids did this at the beach. And uh, he sent me this picture. I sent it on to the campaign. And then on Memorial Day, they put this out there. Um, you know, have a good Memorial Day weekend. And that's what I like it. Like, it's simple enough for kids to do. But then finally, the turning point was the day they argued uh, marriage equality in front of the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, uh, the campaign and Hillary turned the logo everywhere on their Facebook page, on their Twitter feed, everywhere to this. And um, it made the New York Times. It made the Washington Post. It's like Hillary changed his logo to bad, you know, uh, gay marriage. It sort of was like really big news, you know. And the idea that, that, a logo, the cha that changing a logo could dramatize uh, a policy uh, uh, statement was really kind of w was what we were thinking might happen and all And that's along. what the Obama O was doing. Yeah, but, but it, almost inadvertently, this thing had that cooked into the beginning. Then finally, um, it's official. Hillary's logo is actually perfect, in case you needed reassurance about that. So. <laughs>
So it's still, it's still people, so I just, someone just tweeted, it's like the biggest piece of vulgar hackery they've ever seen. So, but it's like not, you know, and then, and then it's, it, my wife said, you know, Mike, I'm not sure this is really all about the logo. I said, it isn't, it's, you know, so, but I think people have these feelings and they get projected onto things. So I'm really proud of this work. I'm really proud to be associated with a candidate I really think is smart and wonderful. So uh, um, I just didn't want to do any harm. And uh, I think in the long run, it may actually help the campaign slightly. Well, we're getting close to the end, but I'd like to know something about how you teach. Because when you talk, it's like a great dawn donning his great robe. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, it's, it's that voice of yours. It's very... The nasal Cleveland accent commanding such authority. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've never heard a call of seductive, believe me. Well, I want to I, I give you a tonight. hanky, yeah, yeah, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about your 100-day project. Um, I'm, a, I'm not a good teacher. Um, you need to be... Um, uh, um, I'm not as patient as you need to be, be a good teacher. I'm not, I don't have the stamina to be a good teacher. And I've had an association with the Yale School of Art where I'm a visiting critic. And at the beginning, I used to, 15 years ago, I used to actually try to teach courses the way I thought they should be teached at an Ivy League school. Teached? The way, I'm getting kind of George Bushy in my locutions now. I apologize. I tried to teach classes the way I thought they should be taught uh, at an Ivy League level. And I'm just not good at it. Um, and um, another uh, fellow instructor there, Paul Elliman, said, why don't you just be yourself? Be a guy who works nine to five down in the city. Then you come up to New Haven and you just say, here's this, you know, here's this thing I'm working on and like knock yourself out. So I used to give different assignments that were, uh, I used to have Nicholas Blackman, in fact, give me uh, assignments from the op-ed page and just give them to this class to do. And then take them back to Nicholas and he would run them actually. It was really great and pay for them, by the way. Um, but then... Um, um, one, I, and I got it to the point where I was only going there once in the spring and once in the fall to formally teach. And Sheila de Bretfield, the department head, gave me the two dates. And I, for some reason, I sort of had this weird kind of Rain Man sense about these two dates. And I counted in between. I saw they were exactly 100 days apart. And I said, okay, here's the assignment. And I just typed up this assignment. As it looked, so it looked kind of like a formal like academic Wait assignment. Wait a minute. You actually realized in your brain... They were 100 days apart. No, no, I had to count. I had to go like one, two, three. And I had to count them but you had times. that instinct. I, had, I sort of sensed something funny was Scary. happening. Scary. Yeah. yeah. I'll do card counting in a casino with you anytime if you buy me a nice and, suit. Yeah. And uh, toothpicks. And toothpicks, too, yeah. Um, Wapner. So <laughs> whenever I get like that, Dorothy starts saying, time for Wapner, time for Wapner. If you saw that movie, you'll know what she's talking about. I, I get like that sometimes. So I saw they were 100 days apart, and uh, Dorothy, um, or excuse me, I, I sort of came, I came home and I said to Dorothy, I think I've got this idea. I just want to like give them something to do on the first, give them something to do and say, you just do it over and over again for 100 days, and I'll come back in 100 days and you show me what you did. And, um, and that's what happened. And so uh, this was a poster that was done several years into the assignment. I did it for six years in a row. Then I took a year off, and I did it some more. And, um, and when I would do it, it was just amazing things. They would, I don't have any of the things to show, but there are, a lot of them are online. And now different people are doing that. Debbie Millman does an amazing version of it. She's really a good teacher. And so I did it as like a way to cover up the fact that I sort of like my idea of teaching is just do this a hundred times, get back to me when you're finished, or, you know. Uh, they, they, we, we were able to have colloquies in between, but, uh, uh, but uh, Debbie really does this uh, here at the School of Visual Arts uh, MFA program in branding. She does great, great stuff with her students, and different people now do this on different levels around the world. People have always done stuff like this as a kind of a zen-like discipline, but I think kind of giving yourself the magic number of a hundred is really interesting. You do um, six and you think this is fun, and then people freak out at around, not at 49 or 60. It's like 17 is like the magic number. You've been doing it for two weeks and suddenly you think, I've been doing this forever and it's like, I can't take it anymore. And, uh, and then if you can get past like the 20s, you'll finish it the whole way generally. Um, and, and so people have done all these different things, you know, do a, film themselves doing a dance every day, uh, tortured a little plastic figure a different way every day. Um, you know, done a, a hundred versions of uh, Jessica Svensson, who worked for us for years, did a hundred versions of a single Mueller Brockman poster. Uh, <laughs> it sounds hilarious, but it was amazing. It's an it's a act of virtuosity. It was like Bach doing the Goldberg variations, like the same song, all these different ways. It was incredible. Could you hum the Goldberg variations? Sure. See, I told you you could have been a musician. Yeah, exactly. Singer, too. Let's talk a little um, bit about your book. Yeah. So, um, 
I put off doing this book for a long time because I sort of, people nowadays, if they do one of these monographs showing their own work, there seems to be this requirement that you subvert the genre and you do it in some way that just upsets people's expectations about what a kind of book like this could and should be. And I sort of, I'm not, I'm not a subversive kind of guy. And I sort of agreed to do the book and then I was frozen for a month or two because I couldn't figure out how to start or what form it should take or what tone of voice it should have. And I swear, I went back to the books that I loved when I was in college, Graphic Design by Milton Glaser, The Art of Advertising by George Lois, Thoughts on Design by Paul Rand. You know, and these were books where it was just, you sort of felt that that person, that Lois or Rand or Milton Glaser was actually just sort of sitting patiently with you showing their mm -hmm. work and talking about how they came to do this or how they came to do that. And I just thought, well, that sounds like a cop-out because it's just not done anymore, but I'll try it and see whether it works. And it ended up being the thing that worked. So uh, the, the book um, is called How To because I basically just show things and I, everything's couched in how to do this and how to do that in a sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek but not subversive way. And then the, the cover, the hardcover wrap is a homage to these notebooks that I have this fetish about. And then inside I basically just take, you know, three dozen projects and it could be like Saks Fifth Avenue. And I just basically, because we happen, I happen to be a little bit of a pack rat and we have very good archivists at Pentagram, we'll show sort of some of the studies that led up to it. We'll explain the mechanics behind how the things came to be made and sort of just talk about, you know, what the um, thing looked like, you know, what it looked like was all done. What's the one you had the most fun writing about? Because the writing is clearly quite good. I, oh, thank you. From Steve Heller, and the writing was good. And and you know, and, I'm not sure you're clapping. It's Steve is like you know overwhelming. I mean, if you get a compliment from Steve, it's serious. Thank you, thank you. I'll clap for you. Um, no, it's um, um, they were all fun to. I have to admit the one, like there were there were certain ones that were very personal that were really fun to write, but there were some that are actually uh, confessional. You know, like where I, like the one for the Museum of Arts and Design, where I was really doing it wrong for half the time, or this notorious thing that I did with, with New, World, New World Symphony in Miami, where I was so lost at trying to, I was designing progressively more horrible logos, and finally the, um, the artistic director of the symphony sent me a sketch and said, please just do it like this. And, <laughs> and, um, and you guys probably would think that was like offensive. And I kind of like pretended I was offended by it. But then I realized, you know, it was, it was literally like doing a crossword puzzle and looking it up on Google. Like, you know, oh, here's the answer, you know. But it sort of wasn't exactly the way he sketched it, but it ended up being the, the, the prompt that I needed to figure out actually how to do right. what I think is a good logo for them. So I think sort of the failures and the difficulties and the struggles are, were more fun to write about. And in fact, I didn't really, I, there were projects I was proud of that I left out of the book because I didn't think the story was interesting enough to justify a chapter. So I think it's that- Very restrained. Yeah, it's it's not it's it's big like this, but it's not you know. Well, let's before we end this and go to the audience. Uh, what is the piece that you are most happy about? Um, the one and that I, I use the word happy, happy, not proud. This happy. this one actually does make me very happy. Partly because it's one of those stories of near failure. I got the I got what for me is a really unpleasant unpleasant assignment. I was the chair of a competition run by uh, an organization no longer with us called the American Center for Design. It was a design competition, and they asked me to be in charge of the design competition. One of the responsibilities of the person in charge of the, design, the graphic design competition was to design the call for entries, the mailer that would be sent out asking my fellow designers to submit designs to be judged by me and my jury. So I could imagine there are certain designers that that would be the dream project. Think about it, completely open brief. I could do whatever I wanted. Uh, two, the audience isn't like, you know, regular people. It's like designers, people who can appreciate, you know, the excellence of my work, right? And then, and then finally, um, it was just, you know, it was all about me. And so, like, you know, what, what's really not, not to like in that combination? I actually hate, I like the all about me part, but I hate the other two parts. <laughs> um, like, I just hate not having a brief. I like it when they say, this is the zoning ordinance for this part of Manhattan. The sign has to be so big. This is uh, the working, you know, I, I like being, you know, it's, it's no fun doing a crossword puzzle if there aren't any squares or clues. You need, you need the clues and you need the squares and boxes. or all, That's what makes it fun to do. Um, and so um, I didn't have any of that. 
And I was, and not only I've been thinking this is going to really be embarrassing, because everyone else knows that I could have done anything, and then he does that. This is before Twitter was invented, so the humiliation was kind of lower grade. You would suspect people hated it, but you wouldn't actually know immediately the way you know now. Um, and so, um, so I remember I just kind of was panicking about it. And uh, and, and but what a, what a great great gift to get to be able to do something so cool like that. And I'm thinking, I have this gift sitting in front of me and I don't know what to do with it. And so they said, well, they, said, they call me and say, how's the poster going? I say, well, it's oh, not, I'm working on it. They say, well, can you send us, you have to write a state, a judge's statement. Could you write the statement that'll go on the back uh, with the judge's statement about like what the nature of the competition was supposed to be this year? So I sat down to write that and it ended up being this stream of consciousness kind of like spew rant that was just sort of like about how, be, how befuddled I was by kind of having to pick a style, understand, kind of figuring out what something should look like without any context, and, um, and trying to decide what would look cool when I just don't have it. And so I just, um, so I, I just wrote this thing and I said, here's the back. And they said, this is, you know, so this is great. You know, why don't we just print this on the front really big? And I was like, oh, that's right, an all type solution. I like, I can do an all type solution. And so then I thought, but what typeface should it be? Helvetica, that guy, Bodoni, it never got over working for Massimo. Helvetica, modernist, boring. You know, some trendy typeface, trying to be trendy, very unsuitable, you know. And so I was sort of like thinking, I don't want to make a typeface, don't make me make a typeface. And then I, I was thinking, well, can I, what, like, how, how could I do this? What instrument could I have where it would be like just come out without the intercession of like, all this crap in my head and all the design stuff floating around me and just have it come out in this pure form. So luckily... Can I interrupt? Yeah. I think we should leave it there and let them guess what typeface you used. Let's just be silent for a minute. Any guesses? No one... Well, uh, no, that would be bad too. No, typewriter, nice guess. Own handwriting is closer. Should I? Yes, no. Okay, so... I, um, I my, need to see it. My, my daughter, uh, Liz, was four years old. She knew the alphabet, but not how to read. And I said, Liz, can, I, can you write down some letters for me? So I just spelled the essay out to her letter by letter, and this is what she wrote. So it's, um, what is good design? Is it problem solving, or is it the coolest thing you can make the client buy? Is it type in an oval, uh, type reversed out of an oval? Is it little books bound with twigs? Old clip art, Xeroxed up 800%. Franklin Gothic and a lot of different sizes all jammed together. What if one letter is a different color? Or maybe some emigre type above a picture of a chair. Should we layer in a quote from Foucault or maybe Groucho Marx? Is this good design or is it something more? And I swear to God, um, using my lovely daughter Liz as like an, in an innocent, utterly innocent instrument of my you know, what was going on in my mind at the point, it was a way of like purifying. It was like laundering ideas, sort of, you know? And it just came out like that. By the way, um, to, when I had this idea, I mocked it up myself and I did my best kids' handwriting. Don't even try to do that. Never try to do that. You want kids' handwriting? Find a four-year-old. They do kids' handwriting. Adults just do things that they think look like kids' handwriting. Don't do it. You can get them from Behance. <laughs> from Behance, that's right, yeah. Font, fonts for a dollar or whatever it is, freefonts.com. But, um, but so there was something about this that actually, not only was it something I really believed in, but it was actually a way of making it kind of universal by out of the mouths of babes, I guess, was the thing. Liz, by the way, is 29 years old, and she's a lawyer at Ropes and Gray up on 6th Avenue. Now. And this People is what live. got her the job. This is what got her the job. If you Google Liz, you'll get one Google hit for uh, her law biography and like lots of ones for this. <laughs> lettering by Liz Beirut. You know, they think, well, how can I get Liz Beirut? I need, I need lettering that really looks like a kid did it. You know, is this Ropes and Gray? Can I speak to attorney Liz Beirut? You know, no, that doesn't happen though. So I'm very proud of this, partly because um, collaborating with my children doesn't happen often enough when it does, and it's happened several times. It sort of is, I've, I've collaborated with, you would actually, might use the word exploit instead, <laughs> uh, but they seem to be happy enough to participate, so. So it's time for some uh, questions from the audience, either our virtual audience or our living, breathing audience. There's a question there. Uh, Michael, do you still have that notebook piece of paper that Liz wrote on? The original? Oh my god, that's a really good question. Do I still have the original notebook piece of paper? I think I probably still have it somewhere. Um, it's, it's, I haven't seen it in years, though. It's buried deep. I wouldn't have thrown it out. 
And I, I remember I just made a, a photo stat of it and I took it. So I've got it somewhere. And she made no, she only made, I think she made one mistake that I had to fix with whiteout. And everything else was fine, including, uh, she did this great thing where I said 800%. He made, she made the zeros really small. And then she said, then when she was writing oval, she said, this is almost like love, isn't it? Except it's sort of backwards. And she said all these just beautiful things that were kind of taking my supposed writing and really making it much more poetic, you know, so. Um, I don't have it. She might have taken it with her, actually. It was like it was not, it wasn't a work for hire job. She actually retained rights over the artwork. <laughs> but she didn't make any money. She didn't make any, none of us made any money on that one, I don't think. Yeah. A question over here, I think. I have a question. Uh, Michael, could you talk about the limitation of typefaces that you used at Vignelli and how that uh, affected you when you got out of there? Yeah. Um, well, Massimo was famous for um, using a limited number of typefaces. And in fact, his exhibition in the Master Series here at SVA um, was built around that idea. And he, he wrote a rant that he wrote himself that he said in a typeface he designed himself, his version of Bodoni. Uh, that said something like, there's a proliferation of typefaces and they're horrible. Um, all you really need is a few basic typefaces and throw out the rest. And so he basically organized the exhibition just around, I think, five typefaces. Uh, um, Helvetica, Bodoni, Garamond, Futura, and maybe Century. Century, yeah, mm -hmm. Century Expanded. And, um, and so there'd be all these things he designed in Futura, all these things he designed in Helvetica, all these things he designed in uh, Garamond. And he was able to build and fill a huge space just with typefaces done, just with work done using those five typefaces. It wasn't quite as stringent as the legend was. But I would, you know, I remember one time I, um, I did a typeface and I used Franklin Gothic on it. And he, I, I did a poster, I used, I used Franklin Gothic, and he, came, and, he, and he literally came to my desk and said, why, what is that typeface? I said, it's Franklin Gothic. And he said, why, you, why use that? And I said, I don't know. Ivan Shermayev uses Franklin Gothic, but the Momo logo is Franklin Gothic. He said, okay. And he said, it was printed already, thank God, because or else he would have changed it. Uh, but I mean, he sort of like, even Franklin Gothic was like, why would you use that when you have Helvetica or Futura? What's the point of this other typeface, you know? And like, never, and like you know, um, uh, you know, um, so that was, ten, I worked there for 10 years. And uh, when I got out, um, when I got out, <laughs> yeah, the Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> SVA style. Um, I burrowed through, um, you, you, know, you grew your hair. I grew my hair. a lot I, of typefaces. Yeah. No, I, um, I, I went through this binge of what I, what I call typographic promiscuity, where I just like was using all these typefaces that I've been deprived of all along. My lovely wife, Dorothy, uh, who I was dating in high school, I'm still married to today, who figures large in all my stories, um, she went to a school called St. Columkill, and she always was marveled when she went to public school. She went to elementary school called St. Columkill, transferred to, to my high school, and always marveled at how um, it was always the, the Catholic school girls who were, had to wear these prim uniforms through eighth grade. When they got to ninth grade at Normandy High, they would be the ones who would be wearing the most outrageous uh, you know, Britney Spears type outfits you know, because they were just so happy to be liberated from that. And she said, That's, you're like that except with typefaces, aren't you? And I said, well, you're saying I'm sort of a typographic slut. That's like slut shaming, isn't it? And, um, but I really, I really binged for a while. But binging is not good either. And I finally you know, hit bottom and then requ required, acquired a little bit of sobriety and sort of came back. I still find typefaces in the, in the moment where you choose a typeface so fascinating and so interesting. I, um, um, even the type, you know, it's funny, the typeface for this book, I was fretting about quite a bit. Liz is no longer available to letter the whole thing. And, um, and so I remember I went around the office and I, I remember I asked Luke Heyman, one of my partners, what typeface should, should this be? And he says, well, let's see. Um, and he pulled a book off the shelf, and it was a book of posters for MoMA uh, that was done in about 1978, all set in Helvetica, designed by Massimo. And he said, this looks pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, oh, really, Helvetica? But we had designed this special version of Helvetica for the Department of Transportation uh, that has... Um, all the titles, the square dots, or the square dots over the I's and J's, and the periods and the semicolons and the colons and everything, uh, were redrawn to be round instead of um, uh, square. You know, because dot, dot, get it, Steve. Um, 
<laughs> no, explain yeah. it. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll talk to me later. But at any rate, the, um, uh, uh, we did this custom version of that, and the Department of Transportation and Monotype gave us permission to use it in the book and in the exhibition. And so you think it's Helvetica, but it's actually this very rare, barely seen anywhere uh, typeface called uh, Helvetica DOT, known only by the fact that it has dots over the round dots over the eyes. And there's a German edition. There was a big panicky call I got where they realized they didn't have rounded umlauts, so we had to go back and get those worked into the thing. So I would have just not had a German edition. <laughs> exactly. I just can't handle it. Exactly. But it was sort of um, it was it was it was really interesting. I mean, everyone who goes through there are people here at the very beginning. The people here are still in school. People here at the beginning of their careers and mid career. And it's very funny how you go through these periods of exploring something and then pulling back from it, then trying something new or hitting a plateau. It isn't one steady thing, at least it wasn't for me. And one of my partners in London, John Rushworth, when he saw the book said, said I was really kind of becoming Massimo now. You know? And I was like, really? And he says, well, that's what it looks like to me. And I'm like, I, I, I said, at the, I said, I took a deep breath and I said, well, thanks, I guess. But he was paying me a compliment, I think. He was probably paying yeah. you a compliment, but it, we know it'll get worse when you take off your collars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and wear, wear a priestly outfit. Another question? Thank you. Hi, Michael. Um, when you're working with a large corporate, yeah, I'm in the back in the shadows. Um, I see you, yeah. <laughs> the creepy spot. Um, when you're working with a large corporation like Verizon or you know, a million of these ones, yeah. do you encounter a lot of resistance, um, you know, given the fact you're coming from one side of things and you're dealing with a large company? Uh, I, I would imagine that varies yeah, yeah, but the company. I and, and if so, yeah. do you have any tips or tricks yeah, sure, sure, to sure. sell an idea? Yeah, um, well, for one thing, I, um, um, like, I like resistance. Uh, um, I just came from a meeting with um, Angie Foster sitting over there, and this is a client who we had actually almost, they had almost bought a logo, and then they decided they didn't like the logo that they almost bought, and they wanted something entirely new based on an entirely new brief. And they offered to pay us a little bit more money, and I have to admit it was really discouraging, but we came back with something that not only do they like better, but I think is better than the first thing that we did. And I said that to them, and I said, um, you know, but don't let this get around, or else like everyone will be rejecting everything we do, that you guys do, that all of us do, just because the next thing is always better. It isn't always like that. Um, the, the biggest problem with, with big organizations isn't so much resistance, it's that um, people with passion and conviction become harder to find. Um, and people who are just doing their jobs become easier to find. That's just the nature of large organizations. And um, each one of my clients, um, up to and including um, Verizon and other big organizations I work with, have someone there, and sometimes multiple people, occasionally lots and lots of people who have passion and conviction, not necessarily taste. I don't ask them to be designers. I don't ask, I don't, I don't like selling things to people, um, but I just want them to really like care about the work that we're doing and to have it matter to them that it be done right. I'd rather have someone, you know, like the, the, the worst kind of reaction that I get when I'm presenting work is, isn't, um, um, I hate that. Because uh, actually, I, I find that really interesting. You know, whoa, I sort of like, you know, I, it's like being a dentist and all of a sudden you find out what tooth hurts, you know, by sticking a needle into it really hard. You know, uh, oh, you hate this? How you hate this? How, how about this? Uh, no, uh, no, so I, 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 I really, I'll draw them out. I sort of, your tendency is to sort of like go on the defense and say, well, let me explain to you why you should like it. You know, instead I say, really? Oh, why? Tell me. Is it the color? Is it, well, how much do you hate the color? You know, how much do you hate the color more than the typeface or the typeface more than the color? You hate both of them. You hate, you know, so like, you know, so I'll, I really will draw them out because you really learn that most clients who are defensive, what they're really afraid of is that you're not going to listen to them. They're afraid somehow that you, they're going to buy something from you and that it's not going to work or their friends will make fun of them or it's going to be wrong in some weird way, right? So, I mean, the way you get trust, the way you kind of develop trust is by acting like you're listening to someone and responding in real time to what they're saying. And if you don't do that, if you just are constantly in selling mode, you know, you're not, you know, they're just going to eventually put a tarp over themselves just to protect themselves from, you know, the, the, the spit that's issuing from my mouth as I'm talking to them. And so um, uh, what I try to do instead is you just find the people with um, passion and conviction, make sure that you just, you know, stick with them as tightly as you can. There are clients that I've worked with. There's, um, you know, uh, Jody Freeman is here in this audience somewhere. I started, I worked with her back in the 80s and worked with her at, 
three different jobs that she's had. And you know, she called me up and said, don't do this, Jody. She called me up and said, meet her at Times Square with $500 in a bag I, you know, tonight. I would do it. I wouldn't ask why or what time or what denominations. I just would do it because I'm really loyal to those people I've connected with who I think we have mutual trust with. So um, I think that that's sort of the trick. And the whole thing about educating the client, I don't do that. You know, I think that if, if there's ed any education, it's almost always my part that I, there's something I don't know about what the situation is. And the more I can know, the closer I am to kind of figuring out how I can build a bridge from what I do to what they do. And selling, I try not to do that too much. Of course, you know, if you read these, I don't read these how to pick up girls books or websites, but I understand this whole thing. You act, you're supposed to act like you just don't care. I just don't care, you know. No, you're supposed to ask certain questions, like how do you make a leg of lamb? How do you, really? What does yeah. that mean? It sounds like a rock. I don't know. I read that or... when I was in my teens. And oh, really? How, how's that, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> Um, so um, I think, and by the way, I think that finally, um, uh, students, um, this is actually the, the, the dirty secret of doing graphic design. Like I said before, it's a social thing. It requires a village to make graphic design happen. Some of those villagers are going to be clients, clients who will pay you to do the work, clients who more importantly will bring you an, an interesting problem to you to solve. And um, uh, understanding how to talk to them, how to listen to them, how to make design understandable for them in what's really complicated and uh, um, intuitive and arbitrary sometimes process is really, the, you, I mean, you don't learn in school because you can't learn in school. And it can be really shocking when you find out what a complex world it is. But, um, you know, if you um, appoint someone as your mentor without telling them, um, and then just watch how they do it and watch how others do it, you eventually can figure out a way that you can do it. I can't do it the way Massimo did it, because Massimo would just say, you know, he'd walk, he'd bound into a room with so much enthusiasm, he'd say, wait, you see this thing we designed for you? And then, um, and, the, and everyone would go like this, and then he'd say, you ready? And he'd sort of, you know, then he'd like, um, li I literally heard him do this a couple times, exactly like this. He'd sort of like have a bunch of boards that had the design on it. He'd go, you ready? You see this thing, this is so great, you're gonna, you will die from this you ready? Then he go like, <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine what it's like when your logo looks like this? Can you imagine? People are gonna, everyone will freak out. It'd be so fantastic. Look at all this. Look at this one. Here is a look. This thing is huge on the side of a truck. Can you imagine this huge truck coming with you? And like, and people would just be like, <laughs> and then, you know, and then, and then, and then, then at the end, you know, they literally every presentation, a standing ovation. People would be crying during these presentations, and like, you know, um. You know, we do these things where our things are all like buttressed by like the brief and the rationale and everything. And Masson would, I actually don't remember ever doing anything like that. It just was always like the thing would sell, it was always the thing would sell itself, but actually it wasn't true. It was like Massimo's enthusiasm and his passion for it would sell it. And um, people just would think, well, who am, you know, who am I to second guess this guy, you know? But then in the elevator going down, they'd say, why was it red? And then, oh, did he say? And then they'd call me up because they're afraid to ask Massimo. So I'd say, oh, red is the most powerful color and represents, um, you know, blood, urgency and blood and li the lifeblood of our business, <laughs> you know, or some, I'd make up something. That's why I became really good at that, by the way. It just dawned on me because I'm trying to get out of this field and start a new chapter of my life. Yeah. I want to produce you doing Massimo the monologue. I could, I could do that. I could be like I, Hal I Holbrook for Abraham Lincoln. We could do exactly. this very easily <laughs> on stage here, get it for free. Yeah. An audience as big as this, maybe larger. I, I couldn't. I could. He was. He was one of a kind, and I'm giving you the merest, uh, uh, just the merest suggestion of what he was like in real life. But you're God like the Bill him. Cosby of Massimo. Sorry. What? <laughs> I don't know where you're going with that, but trust me. You I wasn't sure either. No. It just came. Yeah. Uh, do we have another question? I can't see a thing. Hi. Uh, no. Question from online. Ah. Uh, there's a couple of questions Voice that of God. <laughs> have to do with uh, design and art direction. And the question is, how would you describe the transition from graphic designer to art director? Is an art director an inevitable next step for a designer? Um, it's a next step that I've yet to um, achieve. So uh, its inevitability is obviously uh, overrated in the case <laughs> of my life. Um, but I think, I, I think if I interpret the question correctly, um, it has a little bit to do with what you consider your, you know, your ability to kind of navigate progressively larger, um, larger fields of work and larger kind of resources, larger 
kind, a wider range of resources in a way. And I think you know what I did with the library project in the end, I designed my little logo for it, but I really functioned as sort of the um, as an art director for it. I just would think, oh, you know, um, you know, Raphael Square would be great for this library, or Peter Arkell would be great for this library, and. Uh, in doing that, we would sort of like be able to put together a bunch of different people, each working from their strengths, and actually make a contribution to the center thing. And it's something I really like doing. Uh, I, I, but I always feel like I'm lazy when I'm doing it because I know really talented designers, some of whom are in this room, who actually can not just design but draw and, and create typefaces. Are and you do saying all those a things. prerequisite for art direction is laziness? Um, all, I, I just know my own motivation is sort of I'll get. I'll get Christoph Niemann to do it, and that seems to work every time. And it would work for you, too. You know, so um, I highly recommend it as a career move. So, hope that answers the question. Any other? There's another one? There's a question here. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so the, que the question from the audience is, yeah, what, what? Oh, the question is, um, what about those online uh, sites that purport to give you inexpensive or free typefaces or templates for doing design or crowdsourced logos for $35 and stuff like that? I mean, I think those kinds of things are inevitable, um, you know, and, you know, like, you know they're, they're just, in a way, I think... Uh, um, I mean, I can't, I, 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 I'm, actually, I'm, I'm baffled by that slightly because I can't look at the Target logo and say someone should have been paid, you know, $100,000 for that or a million dollars for that or $50,000 or even $4,500 for that, you know, because um, these logo, I mean, I'll tell people, I say logos aren't that important. They're really not. You know, um, the lady did the Nike Swish did it. She submitted like, I think, five options for $60. And so the Nike Swoosh cost $12, you know. Um, so you do the math on that. They made it up to her later, as at Carolyn Davidson, I understand. But, uh, um, th but, like, I think it's actually, I think that in the long run, people aren't buying, clients aren't buying, like, the work product. As important as it is, as important as Massimo would say it is, the work product is only meaningful if it is embodying a thought process. And you're not buying a thought process when you crowdsource a logo for $35. You're not buying a thought process when you buy a template to do things. Now, Massimo would have said if the templates are nice, he'd rather have people using good templates and doing bad things with their own imagination. He may be right about that, you know. So I think it's a very mixed bag, and it's not all bad, it's not all good. But I think it, the great thing about it is it forces people in this audience who want to be designers to figure out how they're going to get better at what they do and add, figure out where they're going to add value. When, when, I, when, when I came into the field, and I, I share this with Steve and some, other, some of the older, other more senior people in the room, like, like you couldn't set something in type unless you went through me, basically, or went through Steve. That, like, normal people, if they had this vague idea that there was a typeface that they didn't even know the name of, like Helvetica, you know, they'd have, they'd, they had no idea where the, how they could get something made into that typeface. And then even what they would do, with, then what would they do with it, you know? Um, so no one knew the names of typefaces. If they knew the names of typefaces, they didn't know how to, like, order them, where to get them, what would happen with them after they got them. And so the whole thing was like this mystical thing. And I remember thinking, you know, I really felt when I graduated from college that I, like, I know this secret body of knowledge, almost like a magician or someone doing black magic. I know the incantations and the spells, and I have the secret ingredients that normal people do not possess. Now, everyone knows the names of typefaces, and everyone feels qualified to comment on logos. So is that a bad thing? I, don't, I actually don't miss those days where... You know, I think it's better. I think it's, it's fun if a client says, is that Helvetica? And I say, well, it's actually Neuhaus grotesque. You know, it's a redrawing by Christian Schwartz of the original Helvetica. Do you have time? And then, then, you, then, then they're always sorry they ask. They say, no, let's just move on. I just thought it looked like Helvetica. Well, it does look like you know. So, so I think, um, believe me, your expertise will still be appreciated by those who appreciate that sort of thing. But I think it frees us up to move on to more important matters. That's what would all. that be, more important matters? I think I'm thinking in the long run about what the impact our work is, thinking about really what the needs of the audience of you know of the needs of the audience are, spending more time you know listening to people and, and figuring out how we can actually 
you know, have an impact when we've gotten an assignment, what's the nature of the assignment, what, what good can we really do, as opposed to just thinking, hey, I've got a typeface, you know? Right. You, you said you like using the term graphic designer, as Paul Rand liked using the term commercial artist. Yeah. Uh, what has changed in your graphic design world in the last 15 years? Um, well, I mean, certainly everything related to technology. It's everything related to. Te every, I think everything goes back to technology, basically. I mean, like I said, more people are aware of it. Um, everything happens much more quickly. When I started at Vignelli, we didn't have a fax machine. If, if for some, if FedEx didn't exist. If for the only reason something would have to be delivered the next day to another city was that someone had made a gargantuan, costly mistake that they would pay for. You know, you waited until the night before to send that thing to Buffalo. Are you crazy? You know, you had to go out to, like, JFK and negotiate with Lufthansa Cargo to, like, get the thing to go to Buffalo, you know? And then all of a sudden, FedEx made it, like, or okay. Or get a conductor on a train. Get the conductor on the train. I never did that. You did that? I did that once. Wow. Yeah. Is that, like, even legal? You have to slip him something? I slipped him a lot. Wow. <laughs> At any rate, but, but that's how it used to be. And I remember we got this fax machine, and uh, we were all like, wow, this will be such a time-saving device. Now, instead of sending messengers to uh, Queens, we just, like, fax some things. But then they had to get a fax machine, too. But then we both had fax machines. And, it was, and then everyone had and fax machines. And then the machines. world fell apart. Yeah, then no one has fax machines. But yeah. what, in addition to technology, what about the form content oh, of, um, of design? Has it changed... In terms of what you do, in terms of motion, in terms of oh yeah, well I think dimension I mean, yeah definitely. I'm just in terms of I mean speaking of fax machines, when I used to design logos, like the question was like, will this fax? You know, how will this look if you fax it? Meaning, how will it look um, in a low resolution situation where you don't have grayscale and it's all reduced to one color black? And nowadays people say, how will this look um, as a Twitter icon, or how will this look on an Apple Watch, or how will this look when it's moving, or how will this look when it's you know, when it's starting up, they ask different questions, and those questions are good questions. It's much more exciting, and it requires this level of virtuosity of designers that, uh, that I'm amazed that people possess in such, I think the designers that, uh, that I interview, the, the ones that I hire, the ones that get hired by other people, these days the young designers are so unbelievably talented. I look around at people that are doing all the different kinds of work, and it's a moment in time where there are some of the best type designers in the world are alive today, some of the best lettering artists in the world are alive today, some of the best illustrators are alive today, some of the best graphic designers are alive today, and even some of the best book designers are alive today. It's like, it's like a golden age for graphic design, and people really, normal people appreciate it. I mean, civilian, whatever you want to call people who aren't graphic designers, civilians or normal people, whatever. Un unlucky. Unlucky people who aren't graphic designers, but maybe married to one or no one or whatever. Um, and, but like, you know, I think there's so many good people doing so much good work right now and um, that it's, it really belies the idea that there are these existential tr threats to our profession represented by online templates and things. You know, let's have more online templates as far as I'm concerned. If, uh, I, the, the more that seems to happen, the better. It seems to just make everyone better, if you ask me. Let's have one more audience question, and then we'll have to come to a close. Anybody have that elusive micro microscope, microphone? Is there someone there? Yeah. Oh, here it comes. Uh, the microphone is being passed to you, I think. Um, how did the emergence of uh, the computer change your process? Um, I'm 58 years old. I'm the youngest person, probably, maybe, who doesn't, who's never designed on a computer. I've never designed on a computer. I, what I do is um, those notebooks, that's why they're so important to me. That's like where I do my work. And um, every once in a while, I will say something like, did I say it tonight? Like I say things like creative cloud or something or current, you know, photoshoppers. I'd say these words, you know. Uh, creative but, suite. I creative think suite CS5. Five. So five, six or six. something. At any rate, I say these, I throw these words around. Like, like when I'm at Yale, I say. Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when I'm at Yale, I say things like Derrida and Foucault. The same thing. Right. The same thing. Um, and, um, uh, I, and I, 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 every time I've sat down at a computer or even Sometimes when I'm working with designers and I point at their screen, it'll freeze and the whole file is destroyed. <laughs> and, um, and so I just, I, like, I think there will indeed come a time when um, I will um, 
for, where, where no one will want to work for me and I won't be able to afford to hire any work for me. I'll have to go back and teach myself painstakingly how to work in CS27 or whatever it'll be by then. But, I, but up till Dream now, Dreamweaver. Dreamweaver or uh, ready, set, letter set, ready, set, go, if you mm. remember that one. Um, but I, like, um, it's, I mean, it's, what, it, what changed was, um, but you know, what was odd was I wasn't, I was, man, I was the best and fastest paced up artist in Manhattan. I would put my T-square and my X-Acto knife and my ability to do perfectly, exactly seven eighth inch crop marks done with a triple Did you use two coats or one coat? Two coats, of course. Like, wow. yeah. And not wax, two coats. No wax. Not wax, two coat rubber cement. Yeah, and, and all the cut lines were square. It was like and so you didn't have to use one of those rubber things to get a little rubber cement off because yours oh, I would do that. No, I would do that. Everyone does that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, um, no one does that anymore, by the way. Um, but like, I was really good at state-of-the-art production in 19, you know, 80, whatever, six or something. But even when computers started getting introduced right at the end of that decade, I already, I wasn't doing mechanicals anymore. I was like hustling around in suits and kind of having ideas and stuff. <laughs> and so uh, when I got to Pentagram, I, was, I had a computer upon which I, I still, you know, I, I, you know, can I convert a Word document to a PDF? Yes. Uh, can, I, um, can, can I take that PDF file and uh, uh, make it into a zip file? Yes. Can I send it to someone by WeTransfer? Yes, I can do all those things. And I got a few of those. You got a few. You got, some, you got one today. It, they yeah. were in an old program. But they were an old were... program. They couldn't open it. Then no, you tried to no. crash your computer, I bet. But I can do all those things. So I can do a lot of stuff. But, I, but, I, so I have, but on the other hand, I will say that I was never the, I tr I was never the kind of person where kind of where I thought that the means of production was actually informing the way the design looked. I always said, you know, I, if you get, look at that book, half of it's in black and white, not because they were trying to save uh, money on it, because um, uh, my lovely pu publisher, Harper Design and Thames and Hudson, spared no expense in the production of this book, trust me. But there's so much black and white work in it, because a lot of the work I do is in black and white, because I sort of will resolve it in one color, then I think, well, that looks good, I'm just gonna let it go with that, you know? And so I, sometimes I've told people I have ideas that are like one pixel deep. I don't like layering and complexity, I just don't do it, you know? My favorite thing is just something really simple. And uh, the simpler it is, the more I like it, and it's getting worse, not better. And so um, all the, th the, the discoveries that I've watched other people make using computer technology with graphic design, and I've watched and admired with awe, is just like, if I, anytime I've tried to even simulate it, it just is embarrassing and horrible. You know, I'm just happy being like- Being you. Being me, being yeah. me, happy being me. Uh, to end with, are there any metaphors or an analogies that you haven't used tonight that you would like to get out? Um, well, Massimo had one that I adapted. Massimo said we're like doctors, they should trust us. <laughs> right, you like that one, designer? It's very self-flattering, but then, uh, um, but I expanded that and I said, um, you know, if you go to the doctor, this is about listening actually. I say, you go to the doctor, he or she doesn't take you to the pharmacy and start asking you what color pill you like. <laughs> or do you like these oblong ones or I have some square ones here and these ones are pink, you know. <laughs> what does the doctor do? The doctor says, what's wrong? Where does it hurt, right? And if you just kind of have a good bedside manner and you ask where it hurts, then you can start figuring out what the diagnosis is. Then you can figure out what the cure is and then you can go in the back and take out a nice pretty pill and then people say, but I can get cheap, you know, uh, I can get cheap medicine from Canada. That's going to put everyone out of business. No, it's because what they're buying from you isn't the, the pretty pill. They're buying from you the experience that actually makes you feel like you're going to be okay. You know something that's brilliant? Isn't that brilliant? I've just made that up. And it's been a joy, <laughs> it's been a joy because... Uh, uh, I watch too much television, and this real life thing is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. Thank you very you much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
and a full-size model of it was built out in New Jersey just with one letter, a letter E as I recall, the E from Times. And, even, and so everyone looked at it and, was, and sort of became satisfied that, yeah, it would probably work. But I remember uh, being on a bus going up 8th Avenue um, the day that they started installing the sign. And I remember, wait a second, today's the two, if it's Tuesday, this is the day the sign's supposed to go up. So I switched to the right-hand side of the bus, and I saw, actually, I looked down, and I saw, oh, you could read it, you could read it. I almost like, was jumping up and down. And, uh, and actually, if you want, um, if you want to get extra elbow room on a New York City bus, just overreact to a sign on a building. People really give you as much space as you need. It's quite, uh, quite luxurious, you know. Uh, so people backed away, but I sort of calmed down after that. So I think it's exciting, but I'm not sure. Most people walking by there just say, oh, that must be where the New York Times is, and they continue walking on, you know. I actually do think it's very exciting. Thank you. No, when you have that capacity, so. Uh, this is actually kind of an interesting piece because I would, there are, there are things that I th think, like uh, you did the street signs, the yeah, parking yeah. signs, the, the no pooping yeah, signs, yeah. Uh, and I would walk by these flush left, uh, beautifully typographically lined up signs and think, I wonder if Michael did that. <laughs> and I, of course, I never called you to ask, but I found them at the show quite nicely yeah. displayed. But that's something I would ask myself. Did Michael do this system? Yeah. This is something I wouldn't think Michael did. Can yeah, well, you this, speak for Michael? Well, it's, um, yeah. Um, well, what Michael would say if he were here is, you know, um, the, um, and this, this is a case where it was really specific, where this was a, a guy named Jeff Braverman, was a third generation nut vendor from uh, uh, New Jersey. And uh, he had taken the company online, uh, purchased uh, a hard-to-get URL. Their, their URL used to be nutsonline.com, and then nuts.com became available, so he got it. I, I can't tell you who he bought it from, but use your imagination. Um, and, um, uh, and so basically what he and the Braverman family have done for generations is uh, sell nuts, and now they do it online. So if you go to their great website, you can buy all these snacks and whatnot. And then it comes in packages that look like that, in boxes that look like that. And, and they do no advertising. Their only advertising is actually the packaging and, you know, people leaving, you know, when people do leaving their research. Leaving shells. You know, leaving shells around, exactly. But so it was a, and it's a family-owned business, and they have a great sense of humor, really lively personalities. And so this wasn't about... This is a time where I'm kind of grateful that I don't that I'm not a standard bearer for some particular ideology, mm -hmm. because I think my former boss Massimo Vignelli, he would have said, "Well, I guess for this I'll use you know Futura, you know, because it's more fun." Uh, <laughs> type joke for Evan Hore, you know. Some people don't know that. So, um, uh, so, um, um, so instead, you know, um, we tried a bunch of different things, and I said, let me just go hand letter this myself. So that's a typeface done by Jeremy Meckel based on my lettering. And um, then we had Nicholas, um, uh, um, we had um, uh, Nick, uh, Christoph Neiman, Christoph Neiman, sorry, do draw like these little characters. You see one poking up there. And uh, so it was like really just about expressing the personality of these nutty people. They didn't come, to, I don't think, that, you know, Jeff, Jeff called me up because his wife was in a spin class with a woman who was married to another client of mine. And they, I was just, you know, I need some packages. Who knows how to do that? So they came to me. So they weren't coming for my style. They were coming because they wanted, you know, to sell some peanuts. And by God, you know, they have, so. And you're a salty character. Yeah, I'm salty. I know less than you'd think, actually. So the next group, uh, one, is part of a, a series that you've done. You're right. It's hard for me to talk about my own kind of approach to design because I really look at every job as being different. I don't assume that anyone comes to me because I don't like it when someone comes to me because they saw something I designed and they want another thing that looks like that thing. I'm not good at that, and I'm not... I, I can't even reliably replicate the thing I did last time, the appearance of the thing last time with the next thing that comes along. Um, instead, a lot of times people will simply come to me and my team at Pentagram with a project like the one behind us, which was for the New York Department of Transportation, where really the brief was so dense, complicated, and intricate 
um, that it was just a matter of managing all the detail and weaving it all together into a coherent whole, figuring out what typeface was to go in those maps, what color the parks would be, how we'd render each of the landmarks, how, you know, how we would uh, um, uh, indicate where the entrances to subways were. That's what we would argue about. And it's very hard to impose style on things like that. You know, the, the problem is just so intricate. It's like trying to, it's like trying to impose style on like a, uh, um, you know, a crossword puzzle. You mm -hmm. know, you can be good at doing them. You can do them fast or slow, but it, the thing is going to come out almost the same way no matter how you do it. Sometimes. I just want to mention that's one of his analogies that you should be tweeting. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's tweetable yet. I'll indicate the tweetable ones by warning you in advance. I'll count. I'll say one, two, three, four, and count up to 140 characters, and you'll know you're you're good to go. <laughs> Michael, I think actually we had made a deal that Michael wouldn't uh, click around because he's the star, and cl stars don't click. But uh, I think you may have to. I'll, I'll, okay, if you want. At least for this yeah. round. Um, it, it's very similar to do the um, uh, sign on the New York Times building where uh, Tracy Cameron is sitting right there. Uh, had the uh, task of um, figuring out with me how to get a big sign on a glass building that was required by zoning that every sign in Times Square has to have at least one and preferably more big signs on it so it looks like you know Times Square. Uh, Renzo Piano's building made of glass and steel, completely transparent. Your former place of employment, Ashley, Steve. But you were in the old place, right? No, I ended up you, in you, the new place. Yeah, so well. the, I couldn't look out the windows. Yeah, thanks we, to you. No, no, no. So that sign is actually looks opaque from below, but when you look at it straight on, it's actually made out of uh, um, all these little uh, individual pieces that are attached to the breeze of soleil that. Uh, uh, Renzo Piano and his team put on the building, so it sort of accomplishes both things. I maintain that uh, that it was very hard to work it out, but again, I think that it was sort of the uh, virtually the only solution that could have been done for that particular job. And um, uh, you know, figuring out sort of just working our way to it was a challenge in that regard. Now, this well, is before sorry, you talk ahead. about this. Should I go back? One thing I want to thank you yeah. for are the the uh, signs on our office doors. Oh, so, uh, you know, and on the other hand, uh, the, um, there's, I don't have a picture of it, but um, if, you, if, you, if you've already purchased or you purchased the book or you asked for, for Christmas, you will see reproduced therein all these different signs we did for the New York Times interior rooms, which are all, each one of them is different. Uh, every men's room sign has a different picture with guys on it. Every women's room sign has a different picture with women on it. And they will be from the entire history of the publication of the Times. Every mechanical room has something mechanical photographed on it, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the door to the balcony, which has a picture of the Pope on it. So <laughs> you can sort of declaim as you want from that balcony. I assume Steve has fantasized about doing that or perhaps has actually done that. So. I think now I will do yeah, that. Yeah, I should. Um, so th sometimes there are projects that require a kind of anonymity. Um, and like I remember uh, this particular sign, while we were working on it, I was sure about everything except whether or not it would actually be legible, uh, particularly at the, like this time of night when it was sunset, the lights were coming on on the inside. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Francis Di Tommaso, director of SVA Galleries, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone here to this evening's conversation between Michael Beirut and Stephen Heller. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our online audience who is watching this from the SVA website. This evening is also being tweeted live on the at SVA Twitter account, and you can ask a question by using the hashtag Beirut SVA. This dialogue is part of the master series Michael Beirut, now on view at the SVA Chelsea Gallery, 601 West 26th Street. The exhibition is the 27th in a series of career retrospectives originally conceived in 1988 to honor the great visual communicators of our time. The honorees have primarily been designers, but also illustrators, photographers, and art directors, who, held in high esteem by their peers, have remained virtually unknown in the public sphere, where their work is nonetheless widely recognized, a consistent influence 
on the tenor and direction of contemporary visual culture. I invite you to visit the gallery and see for yourself the dazzling array of works that comprise this first Beirut retrospective. For those familiar with their careers, you know what a privilege it is to have these two giants of design speak with us this evening. For those of you not familiar with the man who designed Manhattan, as the New York Times recently described him, you're about to learn why Michael Beirut generates so much buzz. For his interlocutor, here is a severely abbreviated biographical sketch addressed to the maybe two or three persons in this audience for whom the name Stephen Heller only rings a bell. In the late 60s, then an aspiring 17-year-old cartoonist, Steve landed a job doing mechanicals at the underground New York Free Press. A short seven years later, during which he started his own magazine, the New York Review of Sex and Politics, he was hired to art direct the op-ed page of the New York Times. He stayed there 33 years, most of them as art director of the book review. Over the last two decades, he has been a contributing editor to Print, I, Baseline, and ID, as well as the editor of the AIGA Journal of Graphic Design and the online AIGA Voice. All this while also co-founding the MFA Designer as Author Department at SVA and serving as its co-chair. The author, co-author, and or editor of some 170 books on design and popular culture, and also the curator of numerous exhibitions and conferences, Steve received the AIGA Medal for Lifetime Achievement and the Smithsonian Institutional Institution National Design Award, among many other honorifics, including SVA's 2003 Master Series Award. On that nicely coincidental note. Yeah, I, um, um, I've been working for the Yale School of Architecture for nearly 15 years now. And um, the, so this is one of probably 80 plus posters that's displayed in, in the exhibition. By the way, uh, Francis, who introduced us uh, and his team, did an amazing job installing this work. Um, the work is such as it is, but the installation is so gorgeous and perfectly done. If you um, go to it, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Um, if, if you're disappointed by the work in the vitrines and hanging, you will be delighted by the hardware that is actually <laughs> hanging the work and the beautiful way the vitrines and tables and everything else has been made. So please go see it. But um, uh, there's a bunch of, there's about 80 plus of these posters hanging in one of the galleries there. And they represent um, work that I was asked to do by the Dean Robert A. M. Stern, who had arrived on the scene and was determined to prove to people that he was going to run a very diverse and eclectic uh, um, program there that would not be ideologically based, but instead would express all, would respect and express and uh, you know um, honor all sorts of different strands of architectural practice. So again, this is in this case, his Bob's, Bob Stern's previous place of employment was. Um, uh, the Columbia School of Architecture. At Columbia, a fantastic designer named Willy Kuntz had been working for them for years and had developed this style of posters that was remarkable. They used the same typeface over and over again. Same typeface, almost same colors. Same typeface, same, same format, same grid. Amazing. In fact, year after year, they were beautifully the same. Yeah, they're beautifully the same. They vary slightly and sort of it was almost like watching you know, what slight change would he make to it from year to year? And by God, if you saw one of those posters, you didn't have to read a word. You knew that it was from the Columbia Architecture School. So that wouldn't have worked for what Bob Stern wanted to do at Yale. And I don't think designers who, again, were sort of uh, determined to work through a specific style would have had um, difficulty with that assignment. Instead, I came back and I said, my plan is to never use the same typeface twice. We happen to have one up here that, uh, features Helvetica in it, but it's, I think, virtually the only time Helvetica made an appearance in all 80 of those posters. And, uh, you know, previous Helvetica would have been something like, uh, I'm not kidding, like Dom Casual, no joke, if you know typefaces. Hobo, 
I don't know. It looked like you happen. used Hobo for something. You think so, maybe. Well, there was an Art nouveau -y poster. Yeah. It, hobo was Art Nouveau, in your opinion? Yes. Hmm. You want to okay. fight? <laughs> no, no. no, carry on. Uh, moving along. Uh, so, um, um, so this, the, 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 we sort of try to pack some little things into this. So if you have good eyesight, right back there, the, the, um, the Y in a circle changes every time. It's always done differently. That's the logo. It's a circle with a Y in it, but it can be any Y. And in this case, because it's about architecture and psychoanalysis with the Mies van der Rohe couch with all the type like buildings on it, um, the, the, the Y is a Rorschach blot. But again, I made that myself. I had to research Rorschach blots to do it. Hard to do. You did, I mean, there are 80 posters and there are 80 different designs, all with lots and lots of type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must have a great deal of patience. Um, I have a great deal of patience and really, really talented, eager people working for me who have tons and tons of energy and for whom that particular series has been a great way to, uh, um, to just try out new things, to, um, uh, you know, uh, I had a designer who used it sort of to audition interns for a while, you know, just to kind of like try designing one of these posters, see how that works out. So those 80 ones are, um, I had a hand in all of them. Sometimes I can point to a sketch in one of my notebooks that matches what occurred absolutely. Sometimes I would literally say, do something. The last one was like this. This one should be more like that. You know, I, I'm not kidding. This so, is your direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're also a choreographer. Yeah, or a conductor. I conductor, prefer to be conductor. Yes. Yeah. yeah the uh, Let us now listen to a discussion about the life and career of the 2015 master. At its conclusion, our speakers will take questions from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Beirut and Stephen Heller. Uh, but this is not about me, <laughs> is it, Michael? As much as you want it to be about you, Steve, okay. I'd support that. So. I've long admired Michael Beirut, going back to over 25 years ago when we were introduced at Massimo Vignelli's office, and I thought he was Lebanese. <laughs> and I keep spelling it that way. Years later, we worked together along with Paula Scher and Tibor Kalman on two different AIGA conferences, and then with Bill Drentel and Jessica Helfen on Looking Closer Design Criticism books. I admire his boundless energy, enviable elocution and erudition, incredible mastery of metaphor, which you'll doubtless hear tonight, his extraordinary logic, and not least, his piano virtuosity. From the moment I heard him play the 88s at an AIGA conference years ago, I knew this guy was cool. And you will agree that his suit is very nice. <laughs> Michael could have chosen a career in music, or science, or law, or government, uh, and with that nasal twang of his, he might have been a progressive rock radio DJ. <laughs> but he loves graphic design and has devoted his past, present, and future to making it, discussing it, documenting it, and reveling in it. There are many smart design makers and thinkers, but after rereading Michael's earlier book of essays and his recent monograph, which is on sale here, I think Michael has earned his place on the main stage in the design pantheon, and not just about des graphic design. Paul Rand used to tell me about the right way to design, which just happened to be his way. <laughs> when Michael speaks his design talk, he does not impose unalterable truths, but rather allows for the laws of nature to govern design. Nonetheless, he has coined some illuminating truisms. He recently told me that it's not his job to educate a client about design. That's not what he's hired for. And his reluctance to use his pulpit to preach is one part of what makes him such a seductive conversationalist. The other thing is Michael's keen ability to turn a phrase. I guarantee that throughout the course of this evening, you'll tweet many of Michael's pearls. But before he utters them, I prevailed upon a few of Michael's friends and colleagues to share some of the gems, and here are two that ring true to me. Hamish Smith told me that after a client had rejected a logo that everyone on your team loved, you said, we gave them a cure for Ebola, but they chose to remain sick. <laughs> And Paula Scher recalled your warning that clients are not are normal people. Normal people don't know anything about stupid things like typefaces. <laughs> That's right. 
Well, this audience is full of abnormal designers and design students, so we can happily talk about typefaces, logos, design jargon, and all that other nerdy stuff. There will also be time for questions uh, with this and our online audience. So I'd like to start our conversation with this. You seem to have avoided locking into a recognizable Beirut graphic style, but you have an aesthetic and conceptual attitude. Can you tell us how this has worked for you and whether or not you can define, through some of the examples we're about to show, what constitutes a Michael Beirut philosophy, method, attitude, or whatever you want to call it? Um, thanks, Steve. Um, it's, um, it's actually...